Thursday. And east of the Cascades, similar a chance of rain or mountain snow tonight. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Today is Monday, March the 20th, and uh, the night, uh, this is a Moscow uh, regular council session, and I'm so happy that winter is over and spring is on its way, and we're here, so hopefully the weather will be conducive to spring-like weather, similar to what the winter weather was for winter, so we need to get on with that. Catherine? Uh, please rise for the pledge of the flag. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Catherine, and I wasn't specifically picking on her tonight because she's got a frog voice, but we do these things in order, so it was her turn this evening. Uh, with that, I will move on to uh, the next thing, which will be the consent agenda. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to remove item G from the consent agenda, please. Okay, for the record, item G will be pulled. And I would move uh, approval of the rest of the agenda as presented. Second. Okay, we've got a, a motion by Art and a second by Jim to approve the consent agenda with all items with the exception of item G that Councillor Steed pulled. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, you've got the floor, Walter, with item G. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Item G is a uh, request for approval of a, the 2017 Pavement Management Program Slurry Seal Award. Um, and uh, looks like Gary's going to present it. I, I talked to two of your Public Works people today, and I had a call into the third, but... Les was sick today. He was intending to be here tonight. Uh, Tyler had a pre-existing engagement, and Kevin has just gotten back from a couple of weeks off uh, taking care of his wife, so uh, you get me. Good. <laughs> That'll be fine. Okay, what you have before you tonight is uh, the successful uh, proposal or bid from Intermountain Slurry Seal uh, to conduct the city slurry seal program. As you know, this is part of the overall pavement management program that uh, was presented to City Council about three years ago. Uh, so this will be, I believe, our third year of slurry sale, perhaps four, and um, also part of the pavement management program last year included the uh, rubber asphalt that was applied to D Street. Uh, one of the questions that came up earlier is, does uh, the slurry seal contract come out of the $700,000 that the council approved in the FY 2017 budget for uh, the pavement management program, and the answer is yes, that it is. Uh, represents approximately 30% of that budget. Uh, plans for uh, the rest of the budget include uh, several different things. We had intended to do another rubberized asphalt program this year. Um, however, moving ahead with that, we've had some factors that have come up. Some of those have re been the result of the severe winter that we've had. Uh, you've seen damage to 3rd Street. Uh, we have a public project on 6th Street that will go this summer, uh, the sewer interceptor and the uh, turn lane on six, at 6th and Jackson, the uh, eastbound turn lane. Uh, also, um, Almond Street, uh, you've heard uh, Commissioner Dave McGraw talk about uh, the poor shape that Almond Street is in. Uh, those are three big projects that uh, Public Works is looking at the Streets Department to determine if there are possibilities as well. So until we're able to assess that winter damage and those projects are able to be assessed, uh, we've not gone out for the rubberized asphalt application yet. I will note that uh, the Idaho Legislature has been talking about some sort of uh, disaster relief. As you know, Latah County uh, declared uh, disaster for winter road damage uh, just this past week. And we hope that there will be some funding forthcoming from the state. Uh, one of the things that uh, is being uh, looked at uh, is, is it, has there been a full assessment of winter damage to the roads yet? And with the high amounts of water that we've had, uh, anybody who was here on Saturday knows we uh, had quite a bit of rain, and those roadbeds have not dried out yet. So until they dry out and we're able to assess the damage, uh, Public Works has not let that contract or put out to bid the rubberized asphalt project. I don't know if that answers all your questions. 
Walter. Mr. Mayor. Um, Gary, will the third and Jackson Street work you mentioned come out of the 700000 It. I believe there is some amount of 6th Street that has been budgeted, uh, but I can't say that, Walter. 6th uh, Street, of course, is a... Sorry, 6th and Jackson. I think sixth, I said 3rd. 6th and Jackson. Um, there will be uh, involvement by the Urban Renewal Agency, uh, the city. Uh, there will also be some funding from... Um, the underground utilities as well. But I, I'm sorry, I don't have that depth of knowledge as to uh, what the participation in that project will be. Bill might have an idea. Do you? Okay. Bill can tell you what the URA is hoping to spend, but. Mr. Mayor, follow up. Um, Gary, my reason for pulling this is that the council approved five or six years ago a pavement management program, the one that's mentioned tonight. Mm -hmm. um, it was in my memory, a product of Tyler Palmer coming and joining the city uh, and working the street department. It was a program he possibly had seen or run elsewhere, thought it would be a good idea to hear that. The council agreed, mm -hmm. signed on to it. Um, from talking to Tyler this afternoon, um, that program is set up to put 80 percent into preventative uh, maintenance of streets and 20 percent into true repair of streets. And it has just occurred to me that with the winter we've had, plus the fact that the streets were already bad and we were talking about them before the winter, that that mix might not be a, a correct program for Moscow for the next few years, that maybe even flipping it the other way uh, would be a better idea. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't have any problem with this mm -hmm. particular item. I, I get it. It's been bid. It's at a good price. Uh, but... Um, We've got a lot of streets coming you apart. Bet. Yeah, a comment I'd like to make and to Walter's point on that. We don't know yet from the state what we will or will not receive, and so that has a big portion of what we will be able to do from what this winter has caused on our streets, and hopefully we'll find something out within the next week or so on that, Walter. So that may answer some of those questions as well. And if I may, I've had discussions with Les and Tyler, and there's a full understanding out there that um, – there are times when you might not be able to meet the program that you'd anticipated and you have to be able to re react to the individual circumstances. Obviously, with the road damage that's occurred over this winter, that's something that needs to go into consideration on how we proceed not only this year but perhaps even next year. So as they're developing those alternate programs, I thought it was a good idea that they did not put the rubberized chip seal out for bids so that they had a chance to assess these other things to determine if those funds would be best used elsewhere. Well, one thing about it, we talked about this at the previous council meeting and something that I had said at the <coughs> state of the city, there will be a lot of road work this summer. So when you see detours and lots of people working, it slows you down, give yourself some more time because we are going to do a lot of work this summer on roads. Okay. That's all I have unless someone else has Anybody else comments? have a question? Then, I, then I, Mr. Mayor, I'd make a motion that we accept the low bid from Intermountain Slurry Seal Award the contract in the amount of $228,852 and authorize staff for approval of construction change orders up to an amount not to exceed 10% of the contract amount. Second. second. Okay, we've got a <coughs> motion by uh, Walter and a second by Art to approve item G, was, which was uh, accepting the low bid from Intermountain Slur. I'll start the roll with John. Aye. 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 Okay, and we'll move on to the next thing. Gary, staff reports tonight? No staff reports, Your Honor. No staff reports. Okay, the next thing I want to uh, say is we got a bunch of scouts with us tonight, uh, which is pretty neat. So I'd like all these young fellows to come up front here so everybody can get a good look at them. We'll get them on television and bring the leaders with them. I'm going to give one of these guys a chance to speak. Uh, and the reason I like to do this is not to embarrass these guys, but 50 years ago I was a scout, and I've got... It's something that I like. Come on all the way up here, kids. Come on. Don't be bashful. Come way up in front of the podium here. And uh, the reason I want to do this, and this is a scout master, and I'll let you tell us who all these guys are. Well, I'll, I'll let him introduce okay. myself better yet. Um, my name is Jeff Lanigan. I'm one of the adult leaders for Troop 326. We're sponsored by the Knights of Columbus at St. Mary's Church. And we are working on our citizenship in the community, or at least most of us are. Uh, so we're Coming to see how city council meeting works. So with that, guys, if you could say your name loud and clear. 
Johnson. I'm Sydney Stanford. I'm Nathan Lanigan. I'm Fred Dinkins. I'm Michael One of the things I'll say about scouting, ladies and gentlemen, is I did this 50 years ago, and I had no idea when I were these guys' ages that I would uh, fall within the leadership roles in my life that I have. But these are the new leaders down the road. So that's the, the exciting thing about scouting, and it's a bit, very big thing for me, and uh, this, as well as this council up here. So thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, with that, we will move on to public comment and a mayor's response period. We take 15 minutes of our time to let people tell us what's on their minds, as long as it is not on tonight's agenda, as long as it is something that is not in front of planning and zoning, and as long as it's something that is not in front of Board of Adjustments. And as I have told folks before, we like to, we'll give you three minutes to speak. You've got to tell us what your name is, where your address is, and where you live, of course. And uh, one of the things about this council and I as the mayor, we listen to everybody, but you got to remember something, folks. That doesn't mean we act on everything that is asked because that isn't how it works because these guys up here, these men and women up here are leaders of our community that were elected for the jobs that they do. So what they do is they do the very best with what they have to work with, but they listen to everybody and what everybody has to say. So with that, please come on up. Hello, uh, Troy Zachariasen, <clears throat> excuse me, 676 West Pullman Road uh, here in Moscow. Um, so I just have a, a statement, I guess, that I'd like to, to read you guys, and, and I don't know, see what we can, we can do with it. It's been a few years since I've uh, been before the City Council. Tonight I want to take the opportunity to update you on the growth and success of PAC DMS, a private ambulance company based here in Moscow. PAC DMS brought paying jobs for skilled EMTs and paramedics to Moscow in 2014. We started with a small crew and a couple of ambulances, and today our company has grown to employ over a dozen people. In 2016, we responded to more than two th or, sorry, 200 calls from area hospitals to transport patients to higher level of care. During this difficult winter, when helicopters could not fly, PAC DMS was there to transport critical patients when minutes mattered. We at PAC EMS recognize that partnerships are crucial to improving patient outcomes. In fact, mutual operating agreements between agencies are the industry standard nationwide. Over the past year, PACT has partnered with Julieta Kendrick Volunteer Ambulance to bring ALS capabilities to their communities through a mutual operating agreement. Lives have been saved as a result. Just recently, one of our medics responded to a cardiac event in Julieta and rendered prompt advanced cardiac medical care that resulted in saving a patient's life. Teamwork saves lives. Mutual operating agreements, as stated before, are a nationwide industry standard, and examples of private and public agencies successfully working together can be found all over the U.S. Even Moscow Volunteer Fire Department recognizes this and has agreements with virtually every agency in the region with exception of PAC DMS. Over the past few years, we at PAC DMS have made Several attempts to work side-by-side -side with Moscow Volunteer Fire Department, offering to share our resources, more ambulances, paid staff who are ready to roll in seconds, ALS equipment, and more. Much to the detriment of our community, we have been denied an audience with Moscow Volunteer Fire Department by, Chief, by Fire Chief Nickerson and his paid city staff. A couple weeks ago, I had the honor of attending the State of the City Address, in which Mayor Lambert extolled the merits of collaboration and teamwork, and how such partnerships have benefited our community with projects like the airport upgrades. These partnerships are resulting in money saved for our community with the potential for more revenue generated to boost our local economy. In fact, collaboration in Tiburk was the cornerstone of the mayor's address. He provided ample evidence that partnerships make Moscow and the surrounding areas a better place to live and work. It is our understanding that the private, nonprofit corporation that is Moscow Volunteer Fire Department is currently undergoing a leadership change within its EMS division. To complicate matters, this administrative position is a City of Moscow paid position and is not hired by the private, nonprofit corporation that is Moscow Volunteer Fire Department. Therefore, Mr. Mayor and council members, we would like to take this opportunity to once again extend a hand across the aisle in hopes that the City of Moscow and Moscow Volunteer Fire Department will also be inspired by our mayor 
and partner with PACT EMS in order to improve the quality of EMS services in our community. It is our hope that the mayor and the city council will put action behind their words and hold Fire Chief Nickerson and his city paid staff, including the city appointed EMS division position, accountable to the city's vision of teamwork and call for an operating agreement with PACT EMS so that more EMS resources may be made available to the citizens of Moscow at no additional cost to the taxpayer. There's no question, partnerships benefit our community. We at PACT EMS agree wholeheartedly with Mayor Lampert and invite the City of Moscow and Moscow Volunteer Fire Department to collaborate with PACT EMS in order to improve the quality of emergency medical services in Moscow and the surrounding areas, resulting in improved patient outcomes. Let's work as a team in order to save more lives and strengthen our wonderful community. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to working with you in the near future. Thank you, Troy. Thank you. One comment well, that I will make about our EM test, uh, EM, <laughs> our emergency service folks, as well as our fire department, I'm very proud of the job that they do, and they do a 100% great job. They are as top of quality as you're going to run into anywhere in this state. And so everybody out there, make no mistake, uh, the folks that are, work at this city, the folks that work at our fire department, and the folks that work for our ambulance service are top notch. Nothing but A plus top notch. And so out of that, I'll open it up to anybody else. Pack EMS agrees with you as well. <laughs> okay, with that, we will move on to the next item, which is mayor's appointees, and I have no appointments this evening. So the next item will uh, go to David Schott on the Custodial Services Bid Award. David, would you please come up, sir? Thank you, Honorable Mayor, members of council. This is the consideration of the Custodial Services Bid Award. The city issued invitation to bid uh, with published dates in the daily, uh, Moscow Pullman Daily News on February 14th and 21st to provide janitorial services for the following buildings. Here at City Hall, the police station, the Egan Youth Center, Fire Station 3, the Hamilton Indoor Recreation Center, City Shop, the two buildings at the Water Department, Wastewater Treatment Plant, ITC, and the Paul Mann Building. The city hosted a mandatory pre-bid meeting on February 23rd. We had two potential bidders in attendance, ABM Industry Groups and Clearview Cleaning Service. Uh, sealed bids were due and read aloud on March 2nd of this year. With council consideration and approval of the bid, uh, we'll execute a professional services agreement. This is a three-year term agreement. Uh, the term of the agreement is just under three years, from March 27th of this year through January 31st of 2020. The bid results, uh, there was a 10% difference, 10.9% difference in the bids. That translated to about $37,980 between the two bids. Uh, ABM Industries did have the low bid and, and currently provides uh, custodial services to the city and has been responsive uh, for uh, requests of service. Um, staff is generally happy uh, from the 2006 Moscow, uh, 2016, excuse me, uh, employee survey. Uh, generally, uh, people are pretty happy with ABM. So there is an 18% increase from what we're currently paying to the new numbers. Um, so from this year to next year, we'll jump up 18%. After that, from year one to two, it's a 3% increase, and from year two to three would be a 3% increase. I talked with the district manager with ABM to um, understand why it was such an increase. Uh, we did increase the scope of the agreement. Uh, for example, the HERC uh, was cleaned five days a week. We now have got that cleaned seven days a week, so there was an increase in scope. Uh, his first response was wages. Um, according to him, uh, the district manager, he's got his best people working here and he wants to keep them. And so that has a cost with wages. So, so staff's recommending accepting the low bid from ABM industry groups in the amount of $346,300.33, again, for a three-year agreement. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions from David? 
I would, uh, John, I would make a motion that we accept this particular bid in the amount before mentioned for the amount of time before mentioned with uh, the ABM group. Second. Okay, we've got a motion by John and a second by Catherine to mm -hmm. accept the low bid of ABM <coughs> Industries LLC in the amount of $346,000. $300.33 and approve the professional services agreement. I'll start the roll with Walter. Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, the next item up on the agenda is the official park name recommendation for Peekaboo Park. David, you have the floor again. Well, thank you, Honorable Mayor, members of council. Uh, this is the official uh, park name recommendation for the Peekaboo Park property. In September of 2016, City Council approved a development agreement uh, for the Peekaboo Estate Subdivision. As part of that development agreement, 11,782 square feet was set aside as parkland dedication. Uh, the working name for the park was called Peekaboo Park until a former name was considered, a formal name, excuse me, was considered and adopted by council. Um, after a 60-day public comment period, the Parks and Recreation Director, with the approval of the Parks and Recreation Commission, are submitting the recommended name Morgan's Orchard Park to City Council for your consideration. little background just to remind everybody, uh, the park's located in the Peekaboo Estates uh, subdivision up here off Orchard Road on the north end of town. Within that subdivision, it's located here in Track B. So on September 22nd of 2016, the Parks and Recreation Commission um, was pre presented an overview and timeline for the park naming process. Um, after that, we went uh, October 10th. Uh, we started distributing uh, information to, uh, for the city to receive nominations. Uh, we did a little over 30 days. Uh, nominations were due by November 18th. Uh, we mailed 241 letters to everybody within a quarter mile of the park. Uh, two press releases. Uh, there was pickup locations here at City Hall, uh, the Herc, and the Moscow uh, uh, County Library, Latah County Library, excuse me. And I also sent letters to the principals of the Moscow School District schools. So on December 1st, the Parks and Recreation Commission, Commission considered 49 nominations. We got 49 nominations for this park, which I thought was outstanding, and recommended the name Morgan's Orchard Park. And I'd like to take a moment and read the justification for Morgan's Orchard Park. For many years, the David and Ida Morgan family lived on and worked their Orchard Avenue land. David and Ida purchased their, their acreage in 1924, located on the north boundary of Peekaboo Estates. Ludwig and Ida Morgan Morin purchased their property, now Peekaboo Estates, in the late 1940s. The rural setting and furrowed ground of the Morgan property provided a perfect place to raise cows, chickens, grow apples, plums, pears, as well as garden vegetables, turnips, beets, and potatoes. Mrs. Morgan kept careful records for the neighborhood as they traded for goods, a piglet for a bush of apples, or loaves of bread for a basket of vegetables. Her orchards and gardens were known as Morgan's Orchard. David, Ida, and the children are gone, but their grandchildren and great-grandchildren would like to memorialize the Morgan family with naming of the park. And that I was uh, from Kay Morin, who is in the audience tonight, So, and her daughter, Christy. Once the Parks and Recreation Commission uh, selected a name for recommendation, we, uh, we uh, opened up a 60-day public comment period. We did receive one comment. Uh, it's very brief. Um, I agree with the naming of the new park as Morgan's Orchard Park. I appreciate the thoughtfulness and respect involved with naming the park after it's passed. So. On February 23rd, the Parks and Rec Commission considered the single public comment and uh, made their final recommendation to name the Mor park Morgan's Orchard Park. Uh, last week, the Public Works and Finance Committee uh, recommended approval of the official name, Morgan's Orchard Park, and uh, here we are tonight um, for council consideration. So, 
Okay. Take any questions? Questions, questions for David? I just love this naming. I really do. I think the story is fabulous, and, and I've been thinking about it for a week since Public Works. <coughs> um, if I can, I would like to um, move that we approve. I'm going to read exactly what I'm supposed to. <laughs> I want to approve. I'd like to move that we approve naming Peekaboo Park property as Morgan's Orchard Park. Second. <clears throat> okay, we've got a motion by Gina and a second by Catherine to approve the naming of Peekaboo Park property as Morgan's Orchard Park. I'll start the roll, John. Resoundingly, aye. <laughs> aye. 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 And aye. Okay, now I've got to share a little story with you. Then this is what the official name will be, and I think it's pretty cool too. Morgan's Orchard Alley in Ida Moore, and I got a chance to meet. Boy, what a tough lady she was. <laughs> Anybody knew she used to be a dispatcher years and years ago at the police department, and she was a neighbor of mine. And and uh, I got a real charge out of her because she was a straightforward, shoot right from the hip, no BS woman. Am I? Is that right, Kay? This is her daughter-in-law back here, Kay, and a granddaughter, Christy, and I got a chance to know these. Anyway, thank you both for coming here, and, and uh, John isn't with you tonight. Of course, John is Ida's son, but uh, I think this is great that we're having you here. And you, if you want to say anything, you sure can, Kay. Okay, we need. Yeah, we need come on up here. We'll get you on the record. Bring, drag Christy up here. Too. Come on up here. Come, come on, on, everybody. <laughs> and go and tell us. Go ahead and tell us our, your names, Kay, and we'll the daughter. And, and she's came way out from Denver. Yeah, I, on behalf of the whole Morgan family, I am actually Ida Morgan's granddaughter. This would be Ida Morgan's great granddaughter, mm -hmm. and Christy's daughters, great great granddaughters, are here from Denver. So mm -hmm. we're all kind of celebrating this event. So just wanted to thank the Parks and Recreation Commission for considering our nomination and for the council for approving it tonight. It means a lot to the family, and and uh, we look forward to using the park often. So awesome. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'll just say the um, the property has a lot of. I guess history and I grew up there so to be able to take my kids there with the family name means a lot so thank you Pretty, thanks for coming in this evening mm -hmm. Bill mm -hmm. I would uh, <laughs> like to add that uh, back in 1976 I went to work for the sheriff's department and at that time Ida, <clears throat> Ida ran the upstairs part uh, she ran uh, the staff, including the sheriff. <laughs> and she uh, was a force to be reckoned with, but actually pretty damn nice lady. <laughs> okay, well, thank you again. Well, with that, we will move on to the next thing, which is the approval of the relevant criteria standards for the rezone of the North War Bonnet. Uh, Bill Belknap is going to present because Michael Ray is not here tonight, and this. This is a follow-up from what we did on the March 6th meeting. Mr. Mayor, I will recuse myself oh. from this due to family connections with the property. Okay, okay. very good. Thank you, Jim. Let the record show that Jim uh, recused himself uh, from the deliberation on this. Bill. Thank you, Your Honor, members of the council. Uh, so at the council's last meeting of March 6th, the council uh, con conducted a public hearing and approved the annexation, comp plan, land use designation, and rezone of a 10-acre parcel located directly at the north end of the current terminus of Warbonnet Drive. Uh, as the minutes were prepared by the city clerk, the city clerk uh, recognized that the motion to approve the rezone action, which was the last action of that evening, did not include the approval of the reason statement of relevant criteria that is required for all land use decisions that the council makes. Uh, so in your packet this evening is a draft uh, reason statement of relevant criteria for the rezone, uh, affirming, affirming the decision the council made that evening. And it is before you for the council's review and approval. So, Bill. All right. Um, I think this is mostly just an oversight on the part of the council at the time in the three motions consecutively, things got lost. So, uh, to remedy that, I would uh, move approval of the relevant criteria and standards document for the rezone of the 10 acre parcel located directly north of Warren Bonnet Drive. Second. Okay, with that uh, in mind, Art made a motion and John seconded this. On uh, page one of four under the 
third item bill, it says existing 30 acres. At the present, somebody put 10, and I struck that out. That needs to be changed to 30. There's a typo. Did you see? Do you have that on your copy? Um, I do see that. I think it should be 10. It's okay, so we need to make sure that that is correct. correct. It says 30. One says 10, and one says 30. So correct. 10, so we need to make sure 10. everybody understands uh, that, that yeah. is the correct amount. Everybody get that? Item number three. That should read 10 acres, both spots. Is that correct? Good catch. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that in there. Really good kiss. There you go. Well, I read this stuff to you guys, so <laughs> even though the counselors make the decisions on these, I read through this, and I will start to roll with Walter. Aye. 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 Okay, mm -hmm. so we just approved the relevant criteria and standards for the rezone of the North War Bonnet Drive. Thank you, Bill. Okay, we are clipping right along here this evening. And the next item is a Herber Auto Appeal Conditional Use Denial for 407 South Washington Street. Ryan Cash is going to present. But before Ryan gets going here, a couple of things I need to mention to everybody. This is not a public hearing. The public hearing was held um, by the Board of Adjustments, and the CUP was denied. There will be no new evidence brought forward and no new discussion. This discussion is going to remain within the counselor's packet. They all received everything that transpired through the Board of Adjustments. So basically there's one of three actions uh, that we will be considering tonight, and that will either be to approve the CUP or reject the CUP or send the CUP back uh, to uh, the Board of Adjustments for additional information. So those are one of the three events that we are going to do. Is that correct, Rod? Uh, no, and then um, if you're going to remand back to the Board of Adjustment, um, you could ask if, if the applicant, the appellant here today, proffered some evidence, some new evidence that was newly discovered since this time period or evidence that could not have been discovered if, he would have, if they would have used due diligence at the time and convince the council that there may be some new information to consider, you would remand it back to the Board of Adjustment for a new public hearing to listen to whatever new evidence may be presented. That way any respondents would have the opportunity to address that too in a public hearing. So if you remand it back, you can remand it back with instructions, or if you decide that there is new information that needs to be developed, you can remand it back for a public hearing. Okay, Ryan, you have the podium. Honorable Mayor, City Council, thank you for giving the attention to this particular subject. This is the appeal to CUP application for Herber Automotive. The proposal of the applicant is proposing to operate an automotive repair and service shop for one full-time mechanic and two part-time mechanics at the rear tenant space of 407 South Washington Street with vehicular access from the rear alley. The applicant proposes to have vehicular access to the property via alley access from 4th Street and enter the building via an existing roll-up door on the east side of the alley. As part of the conditional use, the owners of Herba Auto have included a detailed circulation and vehicul vehicular queuing plan. Operating characteristics... The business named Herber Auto will operate from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. The business will provide <coughs> basic automotive services, maintenance, repair, and replacement of various automotive systems. Their goal is to provide an automotive service to the downtown area and to reduce a long wait for mechanical services within the city. As you can see here from this area, we have the subject property, which is currently the Follett's building. And within that particular building, the western half of that building is allocated towards Herber Auto. Here we have a street view of the subject property. As you can see, it's the existing Follett's building, and there is some renovations. Just for clarification, the two street side parcels, or that particular section of building, are existing uh, permitted uses that have been approved and are in the construction process <coughs> as we speak. So a little bit of background about that property. The 2,089 square foot subject property is located within the western half of the fault building, <coughs> a 50 by 125 foot lot situated mid-block between 4th Street to the north, 5th Street to the south, a one-way public alley to the west, and Washington Street to the east. The subject is, compromised of three, is comprised of three separate tenants within the subject property, two of which are under construction, occupy the business street frontage, and are permitted principal uses for the central business zone and are not part of the conditional use request. The tenants include a counseling center to the northeast, currently undeveloped space 
uh, proved to be a martial arts studio to the southeast and a separated common hallway between the two spaces that leads to the proposed use and discussion. Herber Automotive will not be located to the rear, will be located to the rear of the property on the western half of the building. Adjacent property is also located within the central business zone and the uses include professional offices in the police department to the north, the post office and federal offices to the east, mixed use retail, residential, a local gym, and an art gallery along the main street to the west. As you can see here is the detailed floor plan of the subject property, highlighted in red. You can see the common hallway separating the north and south businesses along Washington Street. And just on the edge of the screen here, you can see the roll-up door, which would be the access to the northwest of the parcel. Taking a look at zoning, uh, the subject property is located right in the middle of central business zoning. Uh, all other properties within the general vicinity of this area are also central business zone. To identify a central business zoning district, the intent is the principal purpose of the central business zoning district to provide a located location for groups of compatible commercial uses having a common characteristic of not involving more than the incidental and minimal assembly, fabrication, or storage of commodities. Permitted uses include repair shops for commodities, such as household appliances, bicycles, and shoes. And conditional uses include gasoline service stations and car washes. These uses shall be subject to a detailed view of traffic and circulation plans. Limitations on, on the uses include operations conducted on the premises shall not constitute a nuisance beyond the property lines by reason of smoke, fumes, odor, steam, gases, vibration, noise, hazards, or other causes. So looking further into the definitions, the definition of a conditional use is a permitted use in one or more zoning districts as defined by this, city, this zoning code, but which because of characteristics peculiar to such use or because of size, technological processes, or equipment, or because of the exact location which reference to the surroundings, streets, and existing improvements, or demands public facilities require a special degree of control to make use consistent with and compatible to other existing permissible uses in the same zoning district. So taking a look at some of the definitions, automobile service station. During the initial hearing process for the Board of Adjustments, this was one of the most contentious issues as far as the definitions. We go look at the city, the city code as far as the definitions <coughs> of automobile service station, and it tells us to see gasoline service or the gasoline station definitions. Definition of a garage or a public garage would be a building or a portion thereof designed and used for the storage, rental, repair, or servicing of motor vehicles or boats as a business. Gasoline service station, as referenced by automobile service station, states that any land, any area of land, including the structures thereon that are used for the sale of gasoline or other motor fuels, oils, lubricants, and auto accessories, and which may or may not include washing, lubricating, or other minor servicing, but no painting operations. And again, the, we look at the overall definitions uh, identified as far as a repair shop. There are no clear definitions within our zoning that define what a repair shop is. It just makes mention of. Section 11-9, authorized uses. The question whether a specific use is encompassed by a listed use shall be the subject of the zoning administrator's reasonable discretion. So looking at all these definitions, these are all def definitions defined in various zones within the, the Moscow city limits. The question in subject was, where do we find, define an automobile service station versus a gasoline service station? So as we look at access from the subject property, primary access and parking areas within one block of the, of the area, we have primary access from northbound State Highway 95, which identified in this case as Washington Street, westbound onto 4th Street uh, without connectivity to Main Street, southbound onto the one-way paved alley, and east and westbound on 5th Street. Let's take a look at the secondary vehicular and pedestrian access. This is a shot from the south end of 5th Street looking north up the alley. We have alley access for vehicles in and out of the shop, as well as a one-way alley. We have three-hour parking from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. for tenants and customers only. We also have on the, in the adjoining site two ADA stalls to the north and on 4th Street in front of Opportunities Unlimited. We also have overnight parking, which is only permissible in designated areas after 5 p.m. And here we have the regulated downtown parking zone. The areas in green indicated are overnight parking after 5 p.m with normal parking for three hours regulated. We also have the orange, which indicates the three-hour parking zone, the red, which indicates no parking zone, and then the purple that indicates the 3M to 8M, which is a no parking zone. 
So again, and, and finally, for the secondary and vehicular pedestrian access, we've identified areas within the alleys as temporary loading, which is permitted. So again, this is taking a look at the overall site plans as far as it's permitted. The, the general access is from Washington Street to the right, or which would be to the east. That's the primary ingress and egress for pedestrian and foot traffic. No other uh, access would be to the subject property for customer use, uh, essentially wouldn't be permitted with the exception of that east access. Here's the de detailed circulation plan provided by the applicant. The original applicant, the areas, areas indicate the, the overall circulation plan. Again, as discussed before, northbound on Washington, uh, westbound on 4th, down the alley, and then egress is indicated in the yellow as, as the customers would come through. The applicant also included a parking agreement with the corner club. They had come up with a written agreement to identify off-street parking for staging of vehicles within the triangular unpaved surface next to the corner club. Uh, the written agreement indicated that they were going to provide for four separate parking areas for the staging of vehicles. And as indicated here, this is a close-up of that particular area. As well as during the actual process for um, uh, after the, the meeting from the um, chief of police, they indicated that they also had other areas of of parking available. Uh, Chang Sing, actually, they have two more al allocated parking spots. So during this whole process, the, uh, the, the applicant actually had some clarifications uh, before the board uh, from the time that the application was published to the Board of Adjustments to the time that the actual hearing was conducted. Uh, so there is some clarifying remarks that were derived from multiple meetings. Okay, a question. I'm going to stop you right there, sure. Ryan. So the clarifying comments were made during the Board of Adjustments hearing, correct? Correct. Yes, okay. I That's wanted to correct. make sure everybody understood that. That's correct. Right. So so the detailed circulation plan as uh, applied in the applica mm -hmm. application packet um, had been changed based off of a dialogue with city officials as well as with local businesses and for, and as far as coming with, up with parking agreements. Yes, Mr. Mr. Mayor, may I follow up on your question? Sure. Conversation with the chief of police, it occurred at the public hearing? The the conversation with the chief of police, the with the applicant, is that what you're referring to, sir? You, you made a reference a couple of paragraphs ago that someone had met with the chief of police and he had made some other comments <clears throat> Possibly, and the Chang Sing parking came up at that time. So the, was that at the public hearing? The, the public hearing was separate from the the comments from Chief Fry. Uh, actually, occurred the day before the public hearing. Uh, Chief Fry was out of town at the time the applicant had put in the submittal, and so there was some um, some details that hadn't been discussed with the chief as far as how the applicant and the chief had a chance to talk about the circulation patterns. So after that, I, and I can definitely invite the uh, applicant to come up and discuss what was... Well, the, the point, I think the point that Walsh wanted to ask, was that discussed or not discussed during the public hearing? The, as far as... Yes. the question when he asked you. Yes, it, it was discussed. That's what you want to know. So, the, so the discussion was with the chief, but the information was brought up at the public hearing. That's, that's correct. The public hearing. It, it that's just, the point. Okay, that's thank you. I, that's how I understood it, too. It, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't necessarily disclosed in the initial time of the application okay. that was published. Okay. So, But, yes, everything was disclosed after and, and prior to um, the, the meeting. So, Okay, go ahead and continue. Okay. Ryan. Thank you. So we have public works feedback. Uh, this is from the Public Works Department. The lack of private parking may prove challenging for this type of use in the downtown business district. This is a common situation in urban centers and therefore is not an unusual condition for a new business downtown. The availability of public parking will vary based on location, time of day, day of the week, and time of the year. Through our parking restriction zones and areas where overnight parking is available or permitted, the use of public parking will be subject to the parking enforcement regulations, as is the case with all other downtown uses that rely upon public parking spaces. Police Department feedback. Chief Fry has expressed concern that the normal businesses of vehicles going in and out of the mechanic shop will cause a disruption to the police department's ability to respond to the emergency calls for services as well as conducting normal business. This also includes an undue risk of officers having to back up in an emergency situations where the alley is blocked. The police department experiences difficulties getting out onto Washington from 4th Street during high traffic times, and the alley is their only other option. And limiting the access to the alley is already a concern issue with the buses directly from the, across from the police department. Moscow Police would not be in favor of limiting emergency access down the alley to the south for the police personnel. This is the city attorney's interpretation of uh, the, the subject. We have a, a comment that was included into a memo in which states, a gasoline service station, as defined under this code, 
includes automotive oil change businesses. The business is required to sell gas or oil, fuel <clears throat> lubricants, and is also allowed to do minor servicing of vehicles, which in would include routine maintenance, such as replacing vehicles and mufflers. Anything that makes a motor vehicle inoperable, other than the first, than, than the brief time that it takes for a routine change of the fluids or replacing brake pads, for example, would probably not be considered minor servicing. Public garages are spe specifically listed as permitted in the industrial zoning district only, and is only used in connection with heavy equipment servicing as well as operation and truck servicing. For example, it would include such operations normally associated with truck stops. Other considerations for the site, the off-street parking requirements do not apply within the central business zoning district. On-street parking is provided for the public and customers of all, all downtown businesses. And the, the city of Moscow does not provide assigned parking in on-street parking areas. Public Works is a detailed right-of-way use permit that would allow a temporary closure of an alley, street, parking stall, or sidewalk to protect the safety and welfare of the public, assemblies, parades, or while the premises is under construction or maintenance. More about the background, the Board of Adjustment conducted a public hearing on February 7th, 2017 regarding Herber Automotive and the de denied the CUP application based upon relevant criterion standards, criterion number one. The pro proposed use is not a condi conditionally permitted use within the zoning district. After deliberation, the Board of Adjustment answered criteria number two through seven affirmatively and determined that the purpose use, proposed use was not a conditional use within the central business zone thus denying criterion one. And within the packets, the, there's quite a lengthy response as far as criterion one. Uh, I welcome anybody within the public that, that is not familiar with this. Uh, it is uh, available on the public records. Um, but to, in the sake of brevity, to go through the key points, uh, criterion one essentially determined that the proposed use is not conditionally permitted uh, within the central business zoning district. The board relied upon a dictionary and OSHA definition of gasoline service station whose primary purpose of selling gasoline and other motor fuels such as diesel to the general public with the potential for the provision of minor automotive services incidental to that primary purpose. The board determined that the applicant's proposed use is not a gasoline service station as contemplated by, by the Moscow S Zoning Code. Instead, the applicant's proposed use is either a repair shop or an automotive garage and, wouldn't, and would be a permitted or conditional use in other zoning districts but not in the central business zoning district. The owners of Herber Auto filed for a letter of appeal to the City Council on February 22, 2017. The Community Development noticed the appeal before City Council has a public meeting to inform the public and to clarify that the Council shall not act on an appeal which differs materially from that which was considered by the Board of Adjustment. When considering the merits of an appeal, no additional public testimony or information shall be taken or considered by the City Council. Again, as Gary mentioned, the, the council action, after considering the record and the reasons for the appeal, uh, sustain the decision or reverse the decision or amend the decision back to the Board of Adjustment or take the other actions as deemed appropriate. And I'd like to entertain your questions at this time. Okay, okay Ryan, before I start uh, talking to counselors who are asking them, so out of the seven criteria on the Board of Adjustment, <coughs> it was quite, criteria one was the one that they could not accept. All other six criteria were met. That is correct. Is that correct? Okay, I'll start with Jim. Jim had a um, in, the code line. in your schematic of the of the uh, proposed business. There is there any? I didn't see anything on there about how they would store gasoline on site or any other fuel. Correct, and that that was one of the most contentious issues during that board of adjustment hearing was the definition of a gasoline service station versus an automobile service station. Uh, the, the, the that in essence there was the, the, the definitions were drawn from two sources. One was the city code, and the other one was from the um, OSHA's Department of Labor that just goes into the descriptions of gasoline service stations, as well as Webster's Dictionary of the definition of a gasoline service station. So there's no, there's been no provisions or there's no plans for underground gas tanks or above ground fuel tanks to provide gasoline on a what you would Correct. call a business-like basis? Cor correct. So so the way that the code was interpreted from community development was that just because it states specifically there is a gasoline service station that would be under conditional use, there's the other services rendered. It doesn't say primarily or, or secondary uses. It says other uses, including oil changes and minor servicing. And I can go back to that definition for you, too. 
<laughs> also, I noticed in the applicant's um, list of thing of services that they would provide would be like changing of engines and transmissions, which I think would be quite a bit more than oil changing. Correct. And, and that was another clarification. Um, and again, once the applicant gets a chance to define those values, I actually took a few notes on that. So that was a, pro a point of clarification from one of the Board of Adjustment members um, talking about scope of services. And in, from the initial application versus the, the actual scope of services that the, the applicant had brought forward, um, some of those had been changed. Apparently, during the application process, uh, their representative basically grabbed a blanket description of what an automotive service station would be and provided that on the application. After, during the public hearing process, there was actually clarification. And from that particular uh, video of the archives, uh, the services provided included uh, repair powertrains, general services, repair radiators, gaskets, seal replacements, fuel diagnostics, oil changes, stereo installation repair, alternator uh, re removal or replacement, battery replacement, fuel system repairs, uh, scheduled services, and repair or replace of exhaust systems and mufflers. And those were the ones that were clarified during that hearing. So during the hearing, they took off the engine replacement and transmission replacement? Correct. Okay. Let's go down to Walt. Walt, you had a... um, Two things to follow up, if I may, Mr. Mayor, uh, Jim's comment. Um, there was a formal application made for this. It was signed by the applicant, but at the public hearing upon questioning about engine replacements, et cetera, it was stated that, well, we, we didn't really mean that, I mean, effectively, without, I don't mean to be ugly about it, but they just said, yeah, we signed the application, but we didn't fill it out, and that's not really what we're going to do. Okay. Um, can you go to your next to last slide, I believe it is, please? Certainly. One too far. <laughs> okay, down the very last two center, two two lines. <coughs> Uh, three lines, a repair shop or an automotive garage would be a permitted or conditional use in other zoning districts, but not in the CB district. Are they, are they allowed in other zoning districts, plural, or allowed in, I thought I read somewhere in the material <coughs> that they were allowed in industrial zones. So gr public garages would be an example of a, a services similar to this that would be rendered in industrial zones. Permitted area, permitted zones as far as other gas and service stations without requiring a conditional use permit would include motor business zones. Okay, so the two, there's two other zones that this could go in without having to go to the Board of, Ju Board of Adjustment. Correct. Okay. And then, if I may, Mr. Mayor, go ahead, continue. if you would roll back to the picture of the corner club parking. Certainly. Um, no, back to the other one, please. I hadn't thought about this till I saw it on the screen. Pedestrian access to that triangle, you have to either go all the way up to the corner club itself, if you're on the west side of Washington and walking up to that triangle mm -hmm. and cross up above the triangle, up north, or I guess you can cross back down closer to City Hall then cross Second Street, and then cross somewhere else up at first. So my only point to make is that I, I would hate to see something that would create a constant jaywalk situation in that curve. Certainly, Mr. Steve. Thank, thank you. John. <clears throat> yeah, the, uh, it appears that uh, the Board of Adjustments was really concerned about the definition of gas station, service station. Uh, if, for example, these people had decided to put in a gas station, would we be having this discussion? That's 
speculation. I, I, I don't know based off of what the Board of Adjustment may or, or could have been coming up to a relevant conclusion. There, there could have been issues with the detailed circulation plan on this site uh, that, that wouldn't be conducive to the traffic plan. There, there's all sorts of different parameters that may not make this can, can, may or may not make this conductive to a gasoline well, service station. The reason I ask that, it appears to me that in the uh, turning down of this application by the Board of Adjustment, they spent a lot of time talking about uh, this is not a gas station and the comprehensive plan and the city codes mention gas stations only. And the city attorney said uh, that this comes <coughs> close enough that because they are going to be, or uh, what they would like to do would be to offer lubricants and that kind of uh, uh, products that come out of petroleum. So uh, that's the only reason I ask is, you know, are, are we being asked to judge it on something that is really old in, as, as far as uh, when I grew up in this town, that's what that was. It was. And not only that, but it was a body shop. So they painted cars in there. And then it became a glass shop. So that particular piece of property has evolved from a lot of different things into what they want to do with it now and what is being done with it in the um, in the front half of the building. And uh, I, I, I'm still wondering what difference it makes, whether it is called an automotive shop or a gas station. And Rod, that might be me? one for Rod to answer. Uh, under our code and interpretation, gasoline stations also you have to sell gasoline or oils or other lubricants. That would almost be like an oil change business would be allowed to conditionally use there. Mm -hmm. You'd still have to go through the conditional use process um, to get permitted to do that. So if they were going to charge or try to sell gasoline, that would be another thing that figure whether they okay. could even do it there. I'm not suggesting that they do, and I'm sure they're not suggesting that they open up the ga a gas station in, in, in the back end of that particular uh, building. But um, as long as the other things that they sell and provide uh, that does meet the qualification or the definition of gas station. Yes, and under, the, un, under our code it says um, – Gasoline, sell gasoline or oil, and you're allowed to do other minor repairs. Now, the way and I just heard, you he said gasoline or. 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 So the gasoline is just as, it would be as irrelevant as anything else as long as it was or something else. Met, met one of those qualifications, if it was uh, a lubricant shop or an oil chain shop. Okay. Thank you. Walter, you think? Or, 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 you got a question? I was just going to ask again about the zoning question. Mm -hmm. uh, you discussed the zones in which um, a repair shop or auto shop would be allowed by a conditional permit. What zone? Or no, those were allowed by right. Correct. So, what other zones is it allowed by conditional use permit? That's a good question. And there's actually a, quite a few that, that would be permitted within that particular location. Um, Bill, maybe you can shed some light. I Bill, Bill, now? some clarification <coughs> on those. We'll call on your expertise here, sir. <clears throat> if I may, I think the only other zone district where a gasoline or automotive service station is a conditionally permitted use is the general business district. And uh, by permit? As conditionally permitted use, okay. correct. Uh, what about motor business zones? So motor business allows repair shops that are undefined by the code and allows for uh, gasoline stations by right. Okay. That's what I was after. Yeah. Walter? Uh, following John's question a little bit, um, Ron, there, there, there were seven criteria on the table before the Board of Adjustment. And... In reading the, the record of that meeting, 
I was a little puzzled why they didn't have a problem with at least three others that when I read the record rise to, to the top for me. Did they did they take the gasoline definition as just the way to deny this without spending the taking the time and effort to to drill down into all of the others? I mean, the, some of the others talk about uh, noise, dust, vibrations, odors. It's an automobile repair shop is what it's being described as. Um, another one, the endanger the public health or safety. There's a letter in the record from Chief Fry saying, I am not in favor of this business at this location based upon, is in his letter, public health and safety. Mm -hmm. um, it talks about being adequately served by existing streets, public facilities and services, and a third one. And they are needing or feeling a need to reach two blocks north and a block southeast to find a place to get off street parking that's not required, but they apparently felt would be advantageous to present it to the Board of Adjustment. Can, can you read the minds of the board and tell me, let me why they didn't have a problem with those issues? Kyle, let me throw something in there, Ryan, because the dust and the odor and the noise were addressed in the public hearing. According, that, that according is to correct. the stuff that we read, but to the other points that Walter had, I... If, if I could read the minds of the Board of Adjustments, it would make my life a lot easier. So, I, unfortunately, I, I can't read the minds of the Board of Adjustments. And, and please well, don't. Well, the only thing we can do is the only thing we can do is deal with what we have in front of us. Right. And all of this, all of this I just brought up. Yep. is in the package. Yep. So, so in, in, in regards to that, Mr. Steed, essentially, the Board of Adjustment at any point of time could have put a conditional use on any one of those relevant criteria and standards. The Relevant criterion standard about generating dust, noise, and debris could have easily been remediated during the construction process for design plan review. They had mentioned talking about using different tools to, to provide a little less sound. To their so they recognized it, but could have said it can be. Uh, they could have applied modified. a conditional. Okay. Correct. They could have applied a conditional user. Police department. Police department. There, there was actually a meeting, like I had said, after the after the initial application had been sent in, that the applicant had clarified, uh, as, as stated before, the applicant and Chief Fry met the day before the presentation, and they did discuss some of, the, of what was uh, brought up between that meeting uh, to the Board of Adjustments after the fact. Chief Fry did not pull his letter. Correct. Okay, Bill, you had, was there a comment you wanted to make over there to... Seniors. I was just going to clarify, you have the board's written decision before you, so asking staff to, to interpret yeah, yeah. interpret what the board was thinking, I would just would encourage the council right. That's to rely something we've got the to board's written the, decision. This body up here has to make that determination. Nobody's a mind reader. Uh, and Bob. the information about whatever Chief Fry may have said after he wrote the letter, it was admitted as evidence at the hearing. It was hearsay, but hearsay is admissible, and it was considered by the body. Okay. Okay. My two ladies to the left, I have not heard anything from. So, and I, and I don't blame you. you. You got a frog voice. That's okay. If you can't speak, I'm fine with that. Gina? But please. you do blame me because I have a sound voice. Today. You, we Is can hear you saying? just fine, Gina. So, um, I, this is a tough one. This is a very tough decision. Uh, um, I think it's no. very. No, just, you're not making a decision at this point. We're in delib deliberations. It's a tough topic. It. Maybe that's okay. what I want to say then. Okay. Thank you. I'm so glad that you brought me to attention, Mayor Bill. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm, I still need more data. How's that? <clears throat> Mr. Mayor. Jim. I, personally, I don't have a problem with an automotive repair shop in the – yeah, in the central business district, I don't. I think it, all all the other criteria have been met by the applicant, and I think Your it Honor, can be done. Nope. You've yet, yet yet to hear from the appellant, and so the time for discussion isn't until you've considered the appellant's position. As okay. Well. well, let's get him up here then. 
Okay, we hear the appellant. Please come up, sir. Tell us who you are, your name, your address, where you're from, and let us know what's on your mind, and then these guys up here will ask you questions, sir. And, Your Honor, I would just also remind the appellant that the record is there. He can make the argument only on the facts that have been presented before them. You're Nothing not allowed new. to bring anything new into the um, any facts or anything. You're, this is a chance for you to make your argument. Uh, to that, I would um, mention that there are... Uh, I'm sorry, sir. You are... I'm sorry. Uh, Honorable Mayor, I'm Isaiah Taylor. Uh, I live at 421 East 6th Street, Moscow, um, and I'm a co-owner of Herber Auto. And I would ask, uh, there are several definitions of words um, that I uh, can provide here, but we're not... Uh, I don't think they're initially mentioned in the previous hearing should I scrap those or you wouldn't be able to bring in the new definition you can make your argument of what you think they are I mean, okay. as uh, what's presented thank you and your first name again was Isaiah, Isaiah. I could yes, sir. thank you uh, thank you honorable mayor members of the City Council uh, I'm Isaiah Taylor uh, this is my business partner Kip Mock uh, and namesake and renowned local mechanic Jonathan Erber down there at the end uh, we're here to discuss the Board of Adjustments determination that Erber Automotive's uh, proposed business is not a conditionally permitted use based on the first criterion. Um, we respectfully disagree, and here's why. Um, first of all, auto work is needed in Moscow, uh, as you've probably read from the uh, previous minutes. Um, the question is whether or not it should be allowed or whether it is legally permitted uh, per criteria one. So a little bit of legal structure, um, which you saw a little bit in Ryan's presentation, Title IV, Chapter 3, Section 5 defines the central business zone. Um, and number A of that uh, says that the intent is the principal purpose of the central business zoning district is to provide a location for groups of compatible commercial uses, having the common characteristic of not involving more than incidental and minimal assembly, fabrication, or storage of commodities. For example, establishment dispensing retail commodities and those providing professional and personal services to the individual. The CB zoning district is the most intensive commercial zoning district to promote uh, district to promote pedestrian use. Unbroken street level commercial frontage is encouraged in this zoning district. So primarily, uh, we as applicants must ensure that the na the nature of this business corresponds uh, to the intent set out in the code. Specifically, the code pro uh, prohibits more than minimal assembly, fabrication, storage of commodities, it encourages personal and professional services to the individual, and it promotes pedestrian use. As testified before the Board of Adjustment, uh, Erber Auto is a small shop providing professional service by trusted members of the community in a unique location. We will not be performing assembly, fabrication, or storage of commodities, and we, pro we will promote pedestrian use by allowing walk-ins and making a, uh, a front street level access as you saw in the schematic. Additionally, Uber Auto will, prom uh, will promote pedestrian use to the businesses around it as we, will be, as we will present waiting customers with shopping options nearby, including whatever flyers nearby businesses will be, waiting, uh, will be willing to provide us. The marketing signage and interior design is uh, intentionally tailored to jive with the unique feel of downtown Moscow business, and we want our customers to stop in and talk to the mechanics and grab popcorn in our waiting room. We think Uber Auto is in harmony with the intent of the Central Business Zone, and we think that it will be a great addition to Washington Street. Uh, further into the code, the second part uh, is to verify our legal adherence uh, to allowed businesses within the zone. So Part D of Section 5 in the same code that I mentioned defines conditional uses for the Central Business Zone and includes gasoline service stations in Item 6. Um, now, Title IV, Chapter 11, Section 9 contains definitions of terms within the zoning code, and gasoline service station is not defined in, in those definitions. There's no definition for it. Um, however, Item 9 uh, defines automobile service station, and Item 46 defines gasoline station. So gasoline service station is not defined, but gasoline station and automobile service station are. Um, so since it's not directly defined, we must reasonably infer a definition um, and I would like to do this by referring to similar definitions with the code, namely 9 and 46, um, and by general English language usage. Um, and staff can stop me if I'm uh, overstepping, but these are the definitions um, 
uh, for the, my English usage argument, um, one from dictionary.com, which is a place... To bring in outside stuff. resources at this point. All right, thank you. Um, then my argument there is simply that uh, in general language uses, usage, um, which was also brought up by uh, one of the Board of Adjustment uh, members during the hearing, uh, includes for that term uh, repair of vehicles, services, um, and things of that nature. The specific text of item, ni of item 9, which defines automobile service station, is simple. See gasoline station. This implies that gasoline station encompasses more within the code than our standard English understanding would initially imply, which is uh, demonstrated in the code's definition, uh, item 46, which defines gasoline station as follows, any area of land, including the structures, structures thereon, that is used for the sale of gasoline or other motor fuels, oils, lubricants, and auto accessories, and which may or may not include washing, lubricating, or other minor servicing, but no painting operation. These things in mind, it is reasonable to assume uh, that a gasoline service station would include the following things. Uh, first, that it could not include painting operation, um, that it would supply gasoline or other motor fuels, that it would provide service repair, washing, and lubricating, that it could sell auto accessories. Uh, and <coughs> as testified in the Board of Adjustment hearing, we believe that the scope of Herber Auto's repairs uh, complies with this re reasonable um, inference of the definition. Um, and if I could ask that my business partner uh, come up and talk about um, other criterion, but first could I take questions about this criterion one? And sure, the you can address us, Mr. Taylor. Uh, questions for Mr. Taylor, counsel. I, I do have a question. Okay, Jan. Is it, is it your intention if a repair is presented that is more than the the minimal that you would turn it away? Uh, yes, in fact, we've uh, decided as, and this was testified in the uh, Board of Adjustment hearing, that we are not accepting dead vehicles. So a vehicle has to be able to drive into our shop for us to service it. And that part was in the packet that we all that received, that it had to be a, a moving vehicle because the drive right in your shop would yes, be right. something that would be pulled by a wrecker or stalled or anything else. I'll John. Try. Yeah, okay. No, nope, oh. that's all right. <clears throat> I uh, am a little still vague about uh, who is going to move the vehicle from the street, whether it's Main Street, the Corner Club parking lot, or the Changsing restaurant parking lot. Uh, I was under the impression that that was going to be done by the people that work in the shop, but in the text here there were a couple of uh, remarks about the owner of the vehicle doing it. Could you clear clear that up for me? Yes, sir. Um, I, I think Kip is also going to address this, but I can uh, give you a, uh, a sketch of it. Um, the only people who will be driving customer vehicles in the alley will be Herber Auto employees. Um, and the reason we're doing that, there's plenty of reasons, but uh, one of them is Chief Fry's concerns. Um, we've also heard concerns of other businesses around just about alley usage. So the only people to be driving in that alley will be Herber Auto employees who are well aware of all the concerns that have been brought up. So the circulation uh, will be something like uh, customers park in spaces around Herber Auto, walk in. Um, we drive their vehicles to the uh, initial holding zone, which is at Corner Club, um, unless unless we have space in the shop, then it'll just be driven straight in by Herber Auto employees. Um, and then when vehicles are ready to be handled, an Herber Auto employee will go to Corner Club, take the vehicle into the shop, it gets serviced, it gets driven to our Cheng Sing lot uh, where customers pick it up, and Cheng Sing is obviously right across the street. So uh, just to continue clarification, the only people driving in, and, uh, in that alley there will be Herber Automotive employees. I think that I think yeah. you're starting to get to the address of my question, which is under the uh, part one, and it has. I think what we're trying to figure out is what's minor and what's major. Mm -hmm. I think that's like you're a business, so you're going to turn somebody away if yeah. you know. I guess that's the that's the sticky point for me because I 
I don't understand the delineation between minor and medium and major and do you see yes ma'am um, auto shops do turn customers away uh, based on equipment that they have that kind of stuff so I don't think it would be out of uh, regular practice to um, to turn a customer away um, that said I think that our uh, our rule of you have to be able to drive into the shop um, should take care of uh, if not all most of the difference between a minor repair and a major repair but yes, you, you also said that like somebody needed a battery um, changed if my battery's dead I can't drive into the shop right. you, well you can drive in uh, into a shop with the dead battery uh, once your car's jumped yep so but yeah it's so then you're gonna have to go to that lot in the corner club and jump my car mm -hmm. to get it into the shop yes there are remote uh, or on the street or wherever it yep, is parked there are handheld remote battery jumpers um, the we're uh, we have definitely considered um, these these things that have been brought up about you know minor repair major repair and we think that it is uh, satisfied with saying that customers have to be able to you know drive their car to us to be serviced does that answer your question ma'am well when you say mr. Taylor when you say to us you're talking about a parking lot or somewhere else because they cannot drive to you to right? to because the you're gonna pick it up somewhere and drive it in yep to parking near to public parking which is available to all businesses in the central business zone uh, near us from there we will drive it to our lots okay. so so somebody's battery dies and they call you and then you guys are gonna run out with your battery charger and start them up and then they're gonna drive into the shop they're gonna drive it in, not you're the gonna, you're gonna drive, drive to, to the, the shop lot. either our parking lot or the shop depending on uh, what vehicles are currently in the shop the shop space um, we is, is pretty big we, we're gonna have one lift in there uh, for repairs uh, and there's a little bit of space inside there for parking I think we have three spaces inside the shop uh, to hold vehicles but in the event that that's overflowed then we have you know parking down at the corner club to take vehicles just so they're not using up public public parking which is a concern that was brought up by yarn on, yarn on the ground so if it's minor maybe this would that means that my repair would take a couple hours which sure. is why you're saying to the pedestrian nation nature but and then what if it doesn't get done how do I get home um, you would arrange transportation uh, in the way that you would do with you know any auto shop if you took it to you know Bruniel or uh, any of the other auto shops in town but being in downtown Moscow I think prevents uh, sorry presents a unique uh, opportunity of being able to um, uh, walk around to for instance the co-op the co-ops just right next door um, head over there for lunch or something like that so obviously it doesn't make your auto experience 100% perfect but right. it makes it a lot better I think so. and um I'm not sure if I read this correctly or not because there was so much information but I thought also you were defining minor is in a as a term of um, dollars did was that in there but like um, between like 100 and 300 dollars did anybody I'm not sure if that? the board that of was I, was that? we didn't but board of adjustment may have said something about that I'm not sure no I didn't I didn't that. I, I didn't get that, that either that. That. so maybe that's me thinking that would be minor would that be minor um, and you're going outside of the record now. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I, you're making him say something that he didn't yeah, discuss. Yeah. Sorry. So that's, that's I'm just point. trying to get a clear understanding. Yeah. Yes, okay. Now you said you have got Mr. M Mock. Is that correct, Kip yes, Mock? Sir. You want to bring him up? So, young man, come on up here. You need to introduce yourself to <clears> us <throat> and let us know who you are, where you reside. And uh, tell us <coughs> what you think of everything so we can question you. All right, fantastic. I'm Kip Mock. I also live at 421 East 6th Street. Um, I'd like to start off by apologizing because I know it was a little bit confusing for you guys why we had these clarifications in the Board of Adjustment hearing. And honestly, that was 100% my fault um, as I authorized my representative to write the application and signed it uh, as I was out of town without 
thoroughly reviewing it. So I apologize to you guys for that. That was 100% my oversight. Um, but moving on into the circulation of vehicles, I know Isaiah just mentioned this, um, but the circulation of vehicles is again handled 100% by the employees. And what I'd like to do in a couple minutes is, I know we're here to address criteria number one and whether or not this is a conditionally permitted use, but I also would like to give you a reason to actually want to approve this conditional use permit. I'd like to actually show you why Herber Auto in downtown would actually be a benefit. So I have two main reasons for that. The first is the culture of the auto shop itself. It's going to be an aesthetically focused decor, meticulously maintained shop space, and everything done in this uh, shop. Uh, Mr. Mock Hand is saying, was this all stuff that was brought up in the hearing? Is that how you, how you described it at the public? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. I, well, I, and I just want to remind you, uh, sir, that make sure you say stuff that was exactly in that hearing, nothing different than that. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. Because we don't know. We're just taking it for what we're put, piecing together. So we're using the staff over here to kind of help guide us if there's something that's not quite what was said in the public hearing. Of course, yes, sir. Okay, I am only addressing things that were brought up okay. in that hearing. I just wanted to reiterate it to kind of bring it to the table today. Okay. Um, Thank you. So, yes, everything done in the shop is designed not only to fit in with, but also to complement and add to the vibrant downtown feel of Moscow. So not only is the culture itself of this auto shop part of Moscow, and we want it to be part of downtown Moscow, but it brings business to local shops, And I, as Isaiah mentioned. And I think this, I believe, is actually the most important reason for having this auto shop in downtown Moscow, because auto shops placed a mile or more outside of downtown, like Meineke or uh, Moscow Auto Service, I mean, you're forced to drive out to that place and either bring someone with you to give you a ride back if it's going to be a long service or you're just forced to sit there and drink coffee that doesn't really taste good uh, and wait for your oil change or whatever it may be. Um, and so what we want to do with Herber Automotive in downtown is provide a place <laughs> where you can come drop your car off and potentially just walk home if it's going to be an overnight service or something like that. Or you can go grab lunch with a friend at the co-op. You can walk to a coffee shop. You can uh, run whatever errand you need to while in downtown. Um, and so with those two things addressed, and again, I think that second thing is really vitally important to this hearing, that it, what we want to do is bring business to local shops in downtown Moscow. With those two things aside, I'd like to address a couple specific concerns that were uh, submitted by letter and in the Board of Adjustment hearing. The first and chief concern that I'd like to address was from uh, Chief Fry. Uh, and he was concerned about blocking police traffic in emergency exits uh, when they're responding to calls. And Isaiah and I met with uh, Chief Fry the day before the hearing because it came to our attention kind of last minute. And while Chief Fry was unwilling to remove his letter because he said, this is something I need to take a stand on. I'm not quoting him directly, but just to give you a gist of what was said, I, I have to take a stand on this. This is something uh, I think I need to do. He also said to us personally that this is something we can easily work out and uh, in discussions. Mr. Mayor, hang, hang, Mr. Mayor. On, hang on, hang on, just a second, Walter. Um, uh, Mr. Mark, we're going to take Chief Fry's letter as how Chief Fry gave it because that's all we have to that's all we have from Chief Fry. Wonderful. So okay. whatever your conversation with him that was not on this record, we're not going to listen to. Walter, did you have a My point exactly. Okay, okay. wonderful. Thank so you. So any, you know, look at the conversation. We're not trying to be hard on you either. We're just trying to be as fair as possible. Of and course. We're asking lots of questions, and this council is up here going to make it some type of a determination. <clears throat> and so we're trying to get every bit of information we possibly can so we can make the right, correct decision. Of course. Okay, go ahead and Thank continue. you. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, the second concern was brought predominantly by owners and employees of the Yarn Underground about parking. Um, and I believe most of the information that the Yarn Underground uh, owners and employees had at the time of their complaints were based uh, on, a, on something that Isaiah and I had been working on previously. Uh, long previously, I believe in November, we were considering uh, and asking the city to provide allocated spaces obviously that would have infringed on the Yarn Underground. And when we realized what that implied, we uh, dropped that idea and instead we decided to get lots outside of uh, 
outside of public parking. And so parking honestly is not a concern at this point, and we completely addressed that in the Board of Adjustment hearing. Um, and so we just want to make it clear that we aren't infringing on the current business's public parking uh, besides brief portions where customers will park before their car is moved. Um, so the second concern was traffic flow. Um, alley traffic will be carefully monitored and vehicles will not be stopped in the alley at any time. I really want to make that clear because we don't want to be stopped in the alley between 4th and 5th when police officers need to get out. Uh, we addressed this in the last hearing, but I think it's really important to mention. Um, we got two yes, questions I'll, I'll ask. I'll call Walter. I'm going to come back. And, and sure. Catherine had a question as well. Okay. On, on, if I may, on that point. Yes, sir. In the, in the documents, it talks about the roll-up door at the back being closed at all times. I'm one of your employees. You tell me there's a yellow Ford down at the corner club lot. Go get it. Bring it down. We've got room for it. I go down, then I drive up the alley. How do I get the door open, and how do I not sit there and wait while somebody opens the door? I'm, I'm honestly not sure about that documentation. That wasn't anything that Mira Isaiah said or that was in our application. So the door will not be closed at all times? The door was not intended to be closed at all times, no, sir. It, okay, I'll, I can look in the record and see where I saw it, but it was in there. Okay. okay why don't you look for that, Walter, and I'll go to okay. Catherine here. Catherine? Mine had to do with the parking. It's kind of following up with, so you say hours are from 8 to 5. What if you don't get to all the cars that are parked yeah. around town? Oh, yes. So whether or not we get to all the cars that are parked around downtown, they will be moved from their parking spots as, as soon as our mechanics are able to get to them. So there will not be cars overnight. It's Friday from, night, though. Yeah. Like Friday night, you got three cars that are parked around town. You hadn't been able to get to them. Like, what do you do? The cars will be moved to our lots. I, I don't foresee a situation in which cars will be left in our lots over the weekend, but that is a possibility, but they will not be left in city spaces. These are the lots you're talking about that you folks have rented? Yes, That's sir. you're talking about now. The Leonard the, the lots. The corner, they're, they're the corner corner corner. Okay, yeah. Yes. I think I'm, I'm um, was thinking back through what I had read. Walter, I think the, the door shut at all time cr Criteria is, five of the application is one place. For noise abatement. I think that was part of it. There was, there was a statement in there about um, th some of the noise and the dust and that sort of abatement was going to be that the door is going to be closed. There it is. The, it is. Number five, the roll-up door will remain closed so, at all times. Okay. Okay. <coughs> was that the one that you saw, Walter? Was that that I, I'm, I'm still just not sure how you Do don't it. stop in the alley to get right. the door open, but that's okay. Okay. Go ahead and continue. Well, I, I apologize for my misunderstanding on that point. Um, I guess my response uh, off the cuff would be that if an employee was to bring a car in, the door would be open before they left to go get the car. Okay. But that's just my initial response. Okay. Um, so, yes, so that's, uh, yes, so back to traffic flow through the alley. Um, we are obviously our top priority, and it all, will always be our top priority, is making sure emergency vehicles can get through alley without obstruction and that pedestrians are not endangered uh, walking across the sidewalks in those places. So um, that, that is always going to be our top priority, and that's the main reason that only Uber Auto employees will be driving the cars through the alley because uh, all of them are very aware of the situation and everything that we need to be cautious of. Um, so with that aside, I'd like to move on to the last big concern that was brought up in the Board of Adjustment hearing and that was discussed was of noise and odor. Um, Jonathan does heavy repairs in a cramped little garage under his house right now, and there have been a couple times where I've stood in that garage while he's doing. Mr. Mock, no, wait a you're second. actually We're starting to talk a little bit about it, um, we bringing need in evidence talk. about what he's done. Yeah. Of course, okay. We need to talk about right down here, uh, Mr. Mock, where you're going to be, not somebody's house where there's repairs being done now. And okay, yes, what sir. What may or may have happened there is irrelevant to what we're trying to determine here. Okay. Well, then let me move back to what was discussed in the Board of Adjustment hearing and how we address this. Uh, Jonathan operates a very clean and quiet operation. He always has, and he always will do that. And Erber Automotive is going to do the same thing in whatever location we operate in. Uh, as was discussed in the Board of Adjustment hearing, um, the walls in the back of the auto shop are 18-inch thick brick walls. 
uh, and a lot of the noise concerns from the businesses next door were addressing construction that was going on in the front of the building where the walls are not brick all the way through. It's only in that back portion of the building that the walls are actually a lot more thick and a lot more uh, soundproof. Um, and so we addressed all of that in the last hearing and I believe that's all I can present that is not anything new. So if you guys have any questions, that would be wonderful. Questions for Mr. Monk before we I, turn I, back. I, I have a question, Mr. Member. I think it's probably better for Ryan at this time. Maybe we're one, okay. of, the, one ahead, of the applicants Mr. might want to help. We'll get Ryan back up here and we'll put him on the spot. And if we need one of your, you or Mr. Taylor, well, we'll call on you, okay? Thank you. Thank and just you. for procedure, are, are they rest? What's that? Are they resting their first? Yeah, that's what he said. He said he was done. I, he said he was done, so or complete. So, if I may, yep, go ahead, Walter. Ron, how did we get to gasoline service station? The application does not state oh, in the in the beginning gasoline service station. It says would like to operate an automobile automotive repair shop in the rear section of 407 South Washington. The staff report subject is for a proposed auto service and repair center at 407 South Washington. That is repeated in various places, yet when we get to the relevant criteria and standards that were found by the Board of Adjustment, they say the application before the Board of Adjustment was for a, quote, gasoline service station, unquote, their quotes. How did we make that step? So the... St the how, not how we, how did y'all make that step? Correct. So the, the definition of a um, automotive and service station, again, goes back to that definition. The scope of work tied more in line with what the relevant criteria and standards of a um, uh, automotive service station would be. However, going back to those original definitions, that's where it's directed our attention to it, go to a gasoline service station. So the, it's it's with, I guess Bill could probably shine more light on the, the overall definition on how the the city uh, staff came to that particular conclusion. But really, it's 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 where we look at the definitions of the proposed use and how it's applied to the conditional use process for central business. Well, well if I may, ahead, let, let me ask more. you this. <clears throat> John made a comment a little earlier about being somewhat confused, and I, the more I hear, the more confused <laughs> I get. <laughs> the board found against the application because it was for a gasoline service station and following the trail of definitions both in the code and other places. Is an automotive repair shop permitted? I mean, if they, had, if they hadn't jumped to a gasoline service station, where would we be? The automotive repair station is not listed as a defined location underneath Central Business District. So the finding of the board would have been the same. If, it, if they had never talked gasoline. Correct. Thank you. I think I'm clearer. Okay. A little bit. Can we discuss things? Yeah, we can discuss point? whatever you want. Yes. But um, I started earlier on this line of reasoning, but I, personally I'm not opposed to this type of business in the central business district, that I think it could exist in harmony with the other businesses that are downtown. But the way the code is currently written, it's stepping on the line of the definitions. And and I think that maybe the cart's gotten ahead of the horse here, that perhaps the best way to approach it would be to take this back to planning and zoning and change the A definition. Board of adjustment. Oh, okay, something different. It needs to go. What is permitted in the zone would have to go before planning and zoning and change that so that this type of business could easily be accepted as a conditional use within the zone, that that would be the the best way to approach it rather than, well, we're going to make an exception even though we're stepping on the line here. That's but how that, it looks to me. But that's not what we're deciding here tonight, too. No, we can't, yeah, no, we we can't, can't. do that, but we can, I mean, yeah, that's a good discussion point. Uh, John? Uh, uh, clarify stepping on the line, if you would, for me, please. Because 
an automotive repair shop is not allowed as a conditional use in the central business district. And clearly that's the purpose of this business is to be an auto repair shop. The fact that they, they might use oil <laughs> doesn't, doesn't yeah. take it away from being an auto repair shop, which is not a conditional, uh, an allowable conditional use in the zone. So it, it just needs to change the definition of what's allowed in the zone needs to change somewhat in order for it to be inside the line. That's how I see it. Okay. John, it's right here. John, I'm sorry. Uh, what Rod said earlier that the definition of a gasoline station or a automotive repair shop uh, are essentially the same because it says you use oil or lubricants or am I totally wrong about that Rod or well just for the definition on what would be allowed the gasoline gasoline station what they were trying to be most likely what would be allowed down there I'm saying if you sold oil or um, gas or other automotive fluids or lubricants and minor repairing the only place for an auto repair shop is um, li listed is with the garage, and I believe that's in the industrial zone. Yeah. So just in our code, it's not well defined in there. And so they were trying to find a way that what they were trying to do, if it could actually fit in this. And then the decision is, what is minor repair? Mm -hmm. Walton. Round peg, square hole. Yeah. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I have to agree. I, as much as I support the idea of this business in our community, I can't find a compelling argument that hasn't already been made to do anything but sustain this decision. I, on the other hand, feel that uh, what they are trying to do meets six of the seven criteria, and to me, not meeting the first one is very nebulous. And it's uh, kind of like, well, we kind of like what you do. We don't kind of like this. And so we're going to go say these six things are fine, but this one here is kind of iffy, so we're going to go against it. And I think that's wrong. Um, I, I don't think that that's the way we should uh, approach this issue. And if we do need in the future to send these uh, definitions back to planning and zoning, uh, that's fine. And, and let them, uh, if uh, they need to feel the need to go through their process and, and bring it back to uh, the city council and uh, go from there. But as it stands now, I, I'm in favor of uh, letting them have their conditional use permit. Art. Yeah, I'm not real keen on limiting the entrepreneurship of people who want to set up a business and run it and do it well. I think that's one of the things Moscow should be doing. Agreed. However, given the strictures of our code and where we sit with this, uh, it doesn't meet the definitions under the Section 1, as near as I can see. And beyond what the Board of Adjustment had to say, there's still issues existing about public safety relative to Chief Fry's letter. There's also the issue of the noise, and even though the back walls <coughs> might be 18 inches thick of brick, there's still a door through it that is not 18 inches thick as well. And so I see other issues with this too. Uh, further, there are other zones within the city that are more appropriate for both uh, use by right and use by permit elsewhere in the city where a uh, business like this would be uh, much better placed, I believe. Okay. I concur with Art. Okay. Well, what do we want to do, folks? Mr. Mayor, I, I, would, I would make a motion that we sustain the finding by the uh, Board of Adjustment. I second it. Okay, we've got a motion by Walter and a second by Art to sustain uh, the denial of the CPU. Correct? CUP. <laughs> Sorry. I'll start the roll, John. Um, no. 
So the motion was to sustain the decision from the Board of Adjustment. To deny their application? Yes. Aye. 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 And aye. Okay, so it is, uh, goes with what the Board of Adjustment says. So thank you, Ryan, for your presentation. Thank you, thank you for everybody's uh, for what the information they gave us. We will move on to the next item, which is Capital Bond Status Report by Gary Reedner. Gary. of me talking. Can't believe they all didn't want to stay. <laughs> Maybe they looked at Thanks, the topic. Ryan. Maybe they saw my notes. <laughs> wow. Quite as froggy as <laughs> Council Member Bonzo, but I'll try to keep it together. Uh, thank you for your attention tonight. What we're here to talk about today is uh, please the proposed bond issue that we have been considering. The council has been considering uh, general obligation bond to address certain infrastructure. Uh, we'll go through a little bit of history, so to recount. Uh, the purpose for the proposed bond issue and then move on to uh, where we are today. <clears throat> so I'll keep my uh, historical notes as uh, brief as possible. Okay, so first, uh, one of the reasons that we're here is because of the strategic planning effort that uh, the council went through uh, within the past year and a half. Uh, as indicated, it was a long time coming. It was based upon several uh, plans that were developed uh, in order to advise the council as to uh, what conditions were within the city, uh, city's infrastructure, so on and so forth, operational, and then to bring those forward so the council could have a long or mid uh, to long-term perspective on uh, the condition of infrastructure and uh, how to address those issues. So we reported those to the council on March 4th of 2015. If you look right under the last bullet point in the first column, you'll see all of the different things the council considered in looking at those major challenge areas. So there were several uh, major challenge areas. Uh, Short-term uh, or short uh, MCA is the acronym. Uh, and they were the... Uh, major challenge areas, both external and internal. Uh, you can read those. There were seven of them or six of them that were uh, looked at, identified by city council, and which were um, transitioned, I guess, into being addressed with a uh, capital bond. The first was deteriorating pavement conditions. We just earlier tonight uh, talked about the condition of roads within the city of Moscow. Uh, aging downtown infrastructure, uh, park development, and then internal, those that um, are secondary to uh, use by the public, uh, the deteriorating substandard uh, police department building in a vulnerable, unsafe location. It's amazing how everything ties together. We were just talking tonight. Um, I read in one of the letters that was sent in the last uh, appeal hearing that the location of the department and its traffic circulation was somewhat sketch anyway. Uh, and I think everybody can agree with that. It's on a one-way street. Uh, it is in uh, less than perfect condition, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, in a building that's been remodeled from its one of its original uses as a creamery and used to uh, uh, have all of City Hall as well as the police department there prior to City Hall's movement into this building in the mid-'90s. <clears throat> Inadequate fleet shop, park shop, facilities, maintenance facility. Um, we'll talk about that in a few moments. And then aging fire apparatus and replacement. Fire apparatus being longhand for fire trucks. So <clears throat> in addressing those MCAs, uh, we added one to that. And that was the recycling center yard waste drop-off relocation uh, that was only secondarily uh, 
impacted by the bond issue, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, that location of the Recycling Center yard waste drop-off is at C and Jackson Street. So again, what caused us to approach the City Council with uh, the alternative of a general obligation bond? The first is the limited revenues that are available to local government. Um, as we've been talking about the last several council meetings, committee meetings, and virtually every meeting we have uh, when the legislature is in session, uh, the amount of uh, revenue available to local government to meet infrastructure needs is uh, less than adequate, as you can tell by the fact that uh, our roads aren't in the best shape, our, some of our public infrastructure and undeveloped infrastructure is uh, lagging behind. Streets and parks particularly, streets and parks are both uh, special revenue funds. Uh, streets, there is some gas tax, some uh, road and bridge tax that goes in. Uh, in addition, there's support from the general fund. Uh, parks generally uh, are developed with general fund monies. Uh, they do have special revenues from programs, but hardly ever are there any revenues that go toward uh, development of parks except through um, what would be impact fees, which we have not adopted, um, or parkland dedication is how typically parks are developed. Uh, there's a property tax cap of 3% of the previous year's uh, budget. Uh, our current annual increase is 157000 if the council were to take the full 3%. These are FY 2017 numbers. No opportunity for local, local option sales tax. Uh, when the council was approached with the idea of an infrastructure bond, general obligation bond or a loan is uh, very structured. You set out how much funding you desire uh, to meet your infrastructure needs, how long it will be structured, the interest rate uh, that will be paid, so on and so forth. It has to be approved by uh, the voters. It's 66 and two-thirds percent, commonly called the supermajority. Uh, so you would have to have two-thirds of your voters vote to approve that bond. It addresses, in this case, public facilities, equipment, and infrastructure. None of the proposals that would be addressed uh, with the GO bond uh, would be done uh, for operations. Okay, so in the 2017 budget, we had several uh, issues that we brought before City Council. One was there was a feeling by the council that they wanted to limit a uh, geo bond to no more than $10 million. So that was the amount that we uh, looked at, and everything was based on estimates at that point. Uh, maximum 10-year proposed term. That term was set up so that um, you would be able to utilize the funding, address certain infrastructure needs, and then in 10 years, if possible, if the council and the city have done a good job with meeting their obligations that perhaps you could go out and ask the citizens for additional authority. Uh, low bond rates still prevail in the marketplace. Uh, the uh, low bond rates, low borrowing rates are at historic lows right now. So again, addressing the issues that you see below the last bullet point, uh, the police department facility, fire trucks, park development, downtown improvements, pavement management, <clears throat> and a street facility. Now, again, uh, as the council approved us moving forward with that, uh, these were all estimates, and we've been developing those uh, estimates ever since. So this was the proposed timeline. In the summer, fall of 2016, we scoped proposals for those facilities and infrastructure, which was completed. In the winter of 2016, finalization of bond loan proposal for voter, voter consideration. Uh, bond council has been retained uh, as well as a financial uh, advisor. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, retaining them into a later bond issue as well. Uh, then in the winter and spring, the public information process and uh, going out and informing the public and requesting public feedback. And then, of course, May of 2017, the bond election. Again, it's a supermajority. Uh, we are only allowed to go out for uh, bonds twice a year, May or November. So uh, May is generally uh, the best time to go out, so that's what we were focusing on. And that's what was reflected 
in the FY 2017 budget. So we developed, <clears throat> approached this, these issues with, by forming technical advisory teams uh, to develop proposals for each of the areas. You can see all the technical advisory teams. We had a uh, public relations, communication, finance, and planning, uh, so on and so forth, so we could develop all of the aspects of a potential geo bond. And those uh, technical advisory uh, teams have been meeting, and uh, several of them have completed their work. Uh, several of them, or excuse me, a few of them, uh, it's been determined that there was additional planning that needed to be done, and that is being pursued at this time as well. So what we're here to ask you tonight is because of recent developments uh, regarding availability of facilities, we're proposing that the bond election, instead of being held in uh, May of 2017, that it be restructured so we pursue it or present it to council in the 2018 budget cycle, which would mean that a uh, bond election would take place in May of 2018. We'll go through each of the factors that go into making that recommendation. The first is the police department facility. <clears throat> the first thing that was done is the Techno Advisory Committee surveyed potential available locations. Um, I think uh, Council Member Weber and the Mayor were here when uh, the discussion of the Joint Law Enforcement Facility was uh, looked at about eight or nine years ago. At that time, it was determined that uh, the city uh, needed a new police facility, hoped to partner with Latah County. One of the things that uh, the city council made clear at that time and was certainly supported by staff, especially the chief of police, was that the facility needed to be in relative central location to downtown. And uh, that work uh, or that proposal never came to fruition and uh, the need for a new police facility has continued. Uh, the recycling center located at C in Jackson, as indicated, is the yard waste drop-off is unsuitable for future recycling center operations. It's a semi, well, it's not an optimal situation in the middle of summer. The current yard waste drop-off uh, being in a residential area, uh, it, it is somewhat, um, pungent at certain times of the day uh, and going out onto Almond Street uh, when there are people trying to back small trailers in there creates a potential dangerous situation. So it was determined in our MCAs, as you will recall, that the recycling center was ripe to be relocated and a new yard waste drop-off facility be uh, developed. In fact, the Solid Waste Fund has been accumulating funds for just such a move over the past several years. So it appeared that that area where the recycling center is located today was uh, an optimal location. There's not a lot of area in close proximity to downtown Moscow uh, that would house a uh, police facility. Uh, the area along A Street, there are a couple. The um, Dumas site was looked at. Uh, this site, there were several other sites. We were approached by uh, real estate folks and property owners asking whether uh, their site could be considered. Most of those were at the edge of the city or far removed from the central location. So uh, the accessibility to the site at on Jackson Street accessible, the police looked at it from a transportation corridor, good east, east west, and north-south uh, traffic patterns, and in fairly close proximity to downtown. We retained an architect to do preliminary studies of the location and come up with a uh, preliminary design, a conceptual design, and we had originally estimated it based upon cost per square foot, that the cost would be approximately $5 million without the cost of the land. 
that cost was last estimated, and again, it's very preliminary, at $5.6 million, not counting the cost of the land. The cost of the land uh, we estimate to be between four hundred and $500,000. The property is currently owned by the Sanitation Fund, the City of Moscow, with Sanitation Funds, and at some point the General Fund would have to reimburse the Sanitation Fund for that property. So that puts, puts the cost somewhere around six to $6.1 million. Within the last couple of months, um, we looked at were there any other alternatives, and it became clear to us that there is one building in very close proximity to downtown, actually located in the downtown, which might be available. That was the federal building which Gritman Medical Center purchased approximately five years ago, has since been utilizing as an office building leasing space to the one longtime tenant, the U.S. Postal Service, as well as uh, Latah County and several other smaller tenants throughout the building. We approached them and we've received a <clears throat> welcoming let's sit down and talk about it from Gritman Management and their chairman of their board and their board of directors. One of the reasons we're looking at it, as I indicated, it's very close to the core of downtown. It has good access east, west, and north, south. It's about 44,000 square feet of total space. About 11,000 square feet on the first floor is currently leased to the U.S. Postal Service. Police Department space needs are about 15,000 square feet. You'll recall that uh, we submitted in 2015 a um, comprehensive facilities management plan. Uh, that plan estimated the needs for uh, city operations not only now and assessed current facilities but also what they would be necessary in 2033 and beyond. Uh, 15,000 square feet is about the size that you would expect that the police station would need in about 10 years. So it's allowing some amount of growth commensurate with the uh, growth of the city and the community, which would leave obviously significant additional space uh, to be utilized for other needs. One of the things that made this proposal somewhat attractive, at least pursuing it, is that uh, community development and engineering are currently housed in the Paul Mann building, which is the former uh, job service building across the parking lot, which the city purchased in the 1990s. It's a cinder block building, uh, concrete masonry unit, I think is the uh, building term. At any rate, it is, uh, from a structural integrity standpoint, it's believed to be failing. The council just approved a study to be conducted on that facility uh, within the last month, so that's being pursued now. Uh, it's also, even if it was not failing structurally, it is woefully inadequate for the size of the operations within the building. Uh, we, every time there is additional need, uh, for a staff member, um, for instance, we just we hired um, some um, <clears throat> engineering technicians uh, within the last couple of years in order to meet our needs, and they're currently being uh, their office space is a desk within a desk, a counter, if you will. So every time it comes up. Uh, trying to find room in that building. We've talked about putting them in remote locations as well. Uh, community development loses space every time the engineers add uh, someone else, so it's just you're robbing from Peter to pay Paul. In addition, uh, information systems has been temporarily located for the last two years in the Egan Youth Center, located at Dean Mountain View. Uh, their equipment all of their systems are located in this building. They used to be housed in this building. But again, because of the lack of space, uh, we had four employees in an office uh, less than <coughs> one-third the size of this council chamber. probably a quarter of the size. Uh, and it, there would be additional space for other future needs, and staff has been discussing what those potential needs could be. So... Uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk about uh, with the City Council is that um, the choice is pretty clear, at least to, from a staff perspective, that uh, the game has changed a little bit. 
do you spend uh, $6 million or thereabouts on a single-use police facility that is four or five blocks from the downtown core, or should we at least uh, investigate the potential for obtaining a building that not only could house the police facility, but also could meet the city's office needs over the next couple of decades? So it at least was something that we wanted to bring the city council and talk to you about uh, moving forward, delaying the potential bond issue in order that that can at least be investigated. Okay, one of the things that this bond issue is going to address as well was the need for replacement of fire trucks. Uh, we have a history of purchasing fire trucks in Moscow with general obligation bond uh, revenue. 1991, the current fleet was uh, voted on by the community. 66 and over 66 and two thirds people voted for it. Uh, the amount that was voted for was a million dollars, and that was sufficient in those days to finance uh, three pumper trucks as well as half of a uh, ladder truck. Uh, obviously, the cost has gone up a little bit since then. The other half of the ladder truck was paid for by the University of Idaho. Uh, two trucks in the current fleet are beyond their planned obsolescence of 20 years. <clears throat> You've heard in our budget presentations that the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, um, puts a obsolescence of a truck at 20 years. From a practical standpoint, 20 years is uh, when they should be obsolesced anyway, as the model typically is not no longer manufactured, and parts will not, original parts will not be provided after that time, and you have to repair them with aftermarket parts. Two other trucks will reach 20 years by 2021. Now, uh, we've been uh, working with the University of Idaho. They've agree again agreed to fund one half of the replacement cost of the ladder truck. As you can see, uh, the cost of a uh, pumper truck at this point is estimated to be 540000 So obviously, the $1 million bond from 2001 uh, now has increased to a, about a $2 million bond when you add on half of the cost, the 0.6 is half the cost of uh, the current cost of a ladder truck from the University of Idaho. So uh, the replacement cost of the fleet is approximately $2.6 million, $2 million which was uh, anticipated to be addressed with the 2017 bond issue. So we've developed a proposal for the immediate purchase of one fire truck in order to address our most uh, pressing need in FY 2017. That approximate cost of $540,000 would be funded by $277,000 that the council budgeted in the FY 2017 fleet fund and with additional fund balance carryover from the 2016 operations budget. It would allow the council to authorize and staff if this direction is taken by the council uh, or given by the council, we will bring uh, that proposal to you at the next council meeting to get that truck ordered. We're working on a proposal uh, at the mayor's direction and much to the relief, I believe, of the uh, fire chief. We're working on a proposal to fund fire trucks within our regular budget rather than from the proceeds of a bond issue. Whether that can be done or not, we'll test it first as we're developing the FY 2018 budget, which we are just embarking on at this point. Uh, we hope that we will have something to bring to City Council. We have a working model that we believe um, will meet those needs. However, we have to look at the other needs of the city as well and determine uh, whether those numbers will work. So we'll bring that through with the FY 2018 budget. If it's determined that that's too big of a bite to chew that quickly, the council could still make the determination to include purchase of the remaining three or some portion, some number of those remaining three out of a proposed bond issue in FY 2018. But right now, staff believes we have the ability to bring a workable solution to council that would not include bond funding. 
So the reason we brought that up is we wanted to assure the council and the public that we are moving to address the fire truck issue as we would even if the bond were uh, passed. It would still take a year from the time you order the truck till the time it's delivered. Thirdly is the pavement management program. We'd anticipated that um, as a uh, MCA, a major challenge area, the council wanted to put additional funding toward uh, street improvements. Again, if the uh, bond is not pursued in FY 2017, where does that leave the streets? Um, as Walter noted some uh, at the beginning of this meeting, uh, we put the most money we ever have of, of uh, uh, street funding and general fund funding towards street treatments, uh, one of those being the slurry seal, rubberized asphalt, street repair, and other pavement programs of $700,000 in FY 2017. The mayor and council made it perfectly clear that that is to be a uh, priority in the future, so the preparation of the 2018 budget will also uh, bring forward, uh, hopefully, uh, that much or more funding. So again, uh, council would have the opportunity to direct staff when this whole menu of, of things are brought back to council, whether uh, they wanted to uh, fund street improvements with bond money. Park development, uh, you've seen part of this slide before. We do have, as you know, undeveloped parks which have been uh, deeded to the city and which are not being used because park development is fairly expensive. So you have whole neighborhoods where you do not have a usable park. So the park's master plan uh, has development. You've seen uh, several of those plans. I believe four of them come through um, which with fairly aggressive price tags. Uh, those plans are developed with the input of the neighborhood, brought forth from the Parks and Rec Commission, and then brought forward to City Council. Council has accepted the plans, has not approved them or adopted them, but accepted their plans. So the price tag on those, if they were developed full out, uh, would be several million dollars. Uh, Parks and Rec staff have developed a plan to phase park development to include landscaping pathways and playground installation to allow public use as soon as possible. Doesn't mean you're going to get amphitheaters and splash pads and some of the amenities that some of the neighborhoods wanted. Those can come, but it would allow at least some sort of incremental development so these communities or these sections of the community have uh, availability for a park, at least for children's use. So up to $1 million of the 2017 GO bond was proposed to be utilized for that purpose. We're now exploring a combination of bond funding. Uh, and of course, this is incremental, so staff will be doing a lot of the prep work and the construction work, a combination of bond funding and Hamilton funds for council's consideration. The Hamilton funds, of course, would be utilized in conformance with uh, the uh, Hamilton bequest that it be used as much as possible by the Parks and Rec Department for uh, the advantage to uh, young children in Moscow. Okay, inadequate shop workspace and fleet facility. Um, those of you who have been out to the city shop know that uh, the facility has problems. Uh, staff has been doing a great job out there uh, fleet staff, street, water, sewer, uh, parks and rec staff, uh, keeping it running. However, it is woefully inadequate for the number of people in it as well as the equipment that's being worked on and space. Uh, workbench space is at a premium. Any office space out there is essentially at mezzanine level with plywood walls. Uh, any air conditioning, which there is not very much of, are window units. Uh, it is very much a 50s and uh, I'm not even sure it's 60s level uh, oh, shop. It, it has things, it's got issues that need to be dealt with. Council recognized that and declared that to be an MCA. Obviously the comprehensive facilities plan 
made the same finding. So we've been accumulating some funding in the water and sewer enterprise funds. However, streets and parks as special revenue funds do not have enough funding for even the most basic capital funding. So to siphon off a certain amount of money, put it in a separate capital account for uh, use for a facility is almost impossible to do. Uh, <coughs> park development would drop to nothing and any monies that are taken from the street fund uh, would be monies that were not put into street infrastructure. So we have council authorized TCF architects to work on a public works maintenance facility planning study, which is anticipated to be ready for review in the summer of 2017. Uh, that plan is, I've seen preliminary drafts of it. Uh, the cost of a new fleet facility is expensive. And it is something that we will have to bring to city council. Council will have to review, and we will develop alternatives based on that council review. So, again, we are not prepared to move forward in 2017 with any plans for moving on the um, city shop facility. It's still a priority, still working toward it, but we're not prepared to, to present you with a plan in time for any 2017 bond issue. Aging downtown improvements, we have, uh, you know, downtown is utilized in the city of Moscow more than any other downtown I've ever seen. Downtown Moscow and the, and the activities that occur down there are the envy of virtually every other city in Idaho. Uh, it's a great downtown. It's utilized summer, fall, winter, and spring. Uh, the last time it was renovated except for Friendship Square itself, was 1980 when the couplet went in. Um, it was renovated to get the downtown traffic off, or excuse me, the north-south uh, Highway 95 traffic off of Main Street, shuttled off to Washington Street to the north couplet and Jackson Street for the south couplet. And it was renovated at that time pursuant to a uh, LID process. Um, it was one that uh, Walter's laughing because it was in the Supreme Court for several years. <laughs> However, it was uh, the uh, funding mechanism did work. However, we're also looking uh, 35 years in the rearview mirror, and a lot of that uh, infrastructure has not been touched since that time. The aggregate crosswalks, the bulb outs, <clears throat> uh, street furniture in some cases uh, needs to be replaced. There was a resurfacing that was done on the um, street about five years ago, if I recollect correctly. Um, but the infrastructure is failing and it needs to be addressed. So cost of those improvements are also being prepared and we have a pretty good idea of them, where it will fit in council's priority list when we bring the menu of potential candidates for infrastructure to be funded with a general obligation bond um, will have to be considered by the city council. So it brings us to our recommendations. Staff's recommendation is to delay the general obligation bond election until the spring of 2018 to allow time to explore the potential federal building acquisition to meet the police department and other city facility needs. Again, uh, we have just begun preliminary discussions with Gritman Medical Center. We're very happy to be able to meet with them, but it is still very preliminary. There's a lot of... Uh, water that still needs to go under the bridge. As with any acquisition, you're talking about timelines and tenants and uh, price and remodeling costs and structural integrity of the building, all of those sorts of things. We're currently uh, retaining an architecture firm to assist a city team in assessing the building <coughs> in order to determine if it in fact is uh, adequate for city needs. <coughs> That's anticipated to be done within the next month or so. We'll be able then to bring forward incrementally uh, whether the first hurdle can be crossed, and that is, or first bridge, bridge to be crossed, uh, and that is whether the facility meets the city's needs in the raw. In other words, does it have the basic things that the city needs, both in terms of square footage and facility. So once that's done, we can go to the next level and begin the next discussions. So that can't be done. 
Uh, May is fast approaching. Certainly we could have a bond election in November. Not the best time to have a bond election. Uh, it seems that uh, people are more apt to uh, get out, uh, understand what the bond election is about, and more amenable to those uh, sort of elections in the spring. So that would be the target we'd want to look for. So uh, secondly, we will bring back to you, if we're given this direction, to authorize the purchase of one fire truck, a pumper engine. I'm not sure what vernacular the fire department is using this week. To me, it is a pumper truck. Uh, to them, I believe it's called an engine. And uh, direct staff to develop a funding proposal for future fire truck or fire fleet replacement. Again, that could be funded all or part by uh, general funding. And it might be, the conclusion may be that because of the fact that um, of our structure in the city of Moscow, maybe a geo bond is the best way to do it. We'll bring that proposal back to city council. But uh, certainly we are prepared to, uh, we have the funding and are prepared to move forward and want purchase of one truck at this time. Lastly, finalize proposals for the remaining MCAs that I've already uh, beat that mule enough. We've talked about what they are, how we hope to approach them. And then based upon the outcome of the exploration and the proposals, bring a geo bond proposal for your consideration in the fall of 2017. Of course, we will anticipate uh, appropriation for that in the FY 2018 budget as well. We should have at least a preliminary indication to put a budget number together. Uh, but we won't know what uh, the entire cost will be and bring a menu to the City Council for you to consider. Upon that, then we will be looking for prioritization and for allocation, how large the bond issue could be and which priorities fit in within that number. So that's the direction we're seeking tonight. <clears throat> Questions for Gary? <coughs> Walter? Um, Gary, I may have missed it, but the older city council goal of entryway beautification was that is that under miscellaneous or where where did that fall? You you, you did not miss it. Uh, that was not an MCA proper. It was a goal of the city council, which we are directed to continue to move toward. It currently is sitting on my desk, and Good. hopefully we will have. You some, know where it is. Yes, sir. <laughs> It is not something that staff has forgotten about, and we've taken council direction on it. Um, so any fault with not moving it forward lies with me. I will try to remedy that situation. Other comments? Gary went through that pretty good. It's uh, pretty detailed on the direction we're heading. So. Yeah. Are you looking for a motion? Are you looking well, we need some kind of. It doesn't necessarily need to be a consensus I don't think, or what? A consensus. I don't think it needs to be a motion. We just need to let Gary and city staff know the direction we're headed. We had originally planned a 2017 bond. That's not going to happen. You know, city staff is looking for is the direction because we're working on this thing with Ritman to see where how it all works out with the federal building and so on and so forth. Once we get those kind of uh, the rest of that information together for us is going to give us more of a clearer picture, but we're looking at a bond that would uh, come around probably in May of 2018. That's what we're looking for, or city staff's looking for, I should say. As far so. as I'm concerned, pursue it. Yep. Me right. too. Yep. Sound good, to everybody? Yep. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very good much. Enough. Appreciate that it. Is that what you need? Yes, sir. Okay, with that, we're going to start off with reports. I'll start with Jim. Well, I've got quite a gaggle of reports this time. Hmm? I'll make it quick. Uh, <laughs> I'll try it. Remedy, remedy will be at the top of my list here. Um, on uh, March 14th, the Arts Commission met, and the, the crux of that is that if you want to get your artwork on uh, any of the upcoming art things, the Farmer's Market poster, you've got to have your artwork in by April the 3rd. So if you're doing a poster for that, if you're doing art for that, Get on the stick. Uh, for Art Walk, which is on uh, June 16th by April 11th, you have to have your artwork in for that. I'm up quick. Right. Uh, for the library public art um, 
installation. May the 3rd is the deadline for any kind of, and it can be sculpture, murals, or whatever you want to do there. But um, get your proposal in by <coughs> May the 3rd. And the transit sculpture thing is to be announced, so we don't know that yet. Um, uh, Farmer's Market met on the 7th of um, March, and there was a great um, presentation by the Palouse Prairie School about um, their study of how Farmer's Market affects downtown businesses. And the kids did a great job. They went downtown and interviewed all the local businesses and, and um, presented their findings to that, and they, they did a great economic study there. And, uh, and it was well received by the commission. Um, there's an ongoing rate study within the Farmers Market Commission where they're trying to come up with um, a statistically rational basis for uh, any fee changes that might be made and uh, things that are being considered are um, margins of different kinds of vendors, what kind of typically what margins they um, achieve at the market, um, what the attendance requirements are for uh, for season pass holders, whether they can do booth sharing or subletting of the, for people that don't have product for the entire time, for the entire season, but can still get a season pass. It's kind of the crux of that. Uh, Palouse Knowledge Corridor met on the 9th, and they're working hard on the uh, Be the Entrepreneur Boot Camp for this spring, and they're working uh, with uh, both both universities to try and identify emerging technologies that could be located on the Palouse. New businesses, not ones that uh, they still want to retain ones that are already here, but working really hard to identify new Schweitzer Engineering's that could yeah. could locate here. Um, uh, in uh, Catherine's stead, I went to the volunteer fire department um, meeting uh, on the 13th. And uh, the crux of that is that the fund drive, uh, they have a goal of 93000 to raise this year, and they're um, at 90500 or 97% of goal, so wow. we're getting pretty close. So they get 100 last year. Yeah, I, they'll, they'll get 100. It's coming up. They've got plenty of time. <laughs> and uh, uh, also there was a report by the resident firefighters about the uh, – Scott Firefighter Stair Climb that uh, took place in Seattle at the Columbia Center um, on the 12th. And um, I attended that and, and participated thanks to you Mr. Did, you did more than attend. <laughs> thanks to uh, Mr. Steed's uh, challenge. And uh, I thank everybody that helped sponsor that. We raised $2.3 million Whoa. towards the uh, eradication of lymphoma and leukemia. And it's a fabulous event if you ever get a chance to go. I had no idea the scale of it. Um, oh, there was big. almost 2,000 firefighters from all around the world climbing oh, the tower in one day. Yeah, <laughs> on the vertical scale. A uh, little fun fact on that: if um, the Moscow Fire Department would have had in the 18 to 20 age group would have had the top five places, if I wasn't 62. <laughs> 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 so the kids did really well. It was great to spend time with them. And I also want to thank uh, Ken and Carol Robinson for their fabulous support of this this enterprise because they, they do a lot to make this happen. Cool. That's all I have. Okay, good job, Jim. Good job. <laughs> all right. I can be very brief. I, I will defer the National League of Cities meeting to you, and I have nothing. Okay. All right. Walter. Not much left after Jim's stuff. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, I attended along with several other uh, staff and, and elected officials the uh, semi-annual town and gown. First one I've been able to go to. I've always been out of town when they've called them before. Wow. But that was that was good. Got to meet and talk with the senators and with actually met some of the U of I leadership that have been around for anywhere from six months to two years, and I've never met them. So that was kind of good. Cool. Um, on the 8th, I uh, had the uh, planning and zoning uh by monthly meeting where they talked about off street parking standards. They went over uh, comprehensive plan update proposals for chapters two and three, and also took a look at uh, what other communities are doing with use table ordinances where they uh, list out what's permitted and conditional, conditional uses by zone. Probably could have used that tonight in our it previous been discussion. Handy. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, along with Art, the mayor, Gary, is that it? Yep. We went to the National League of Cities um, last week, beginning on Saturday, with some leadership training and on into uh, Wednesday when we met with the uh, Idaho Congressionals. Um, 
I won't take too much of it because I'm sure the mayor's got a good bit to say about it. But with the uh, congressionals this time, we emphasized uh, two or three things, a couple of which I was interested in was, one, the uh, National League of Cities had raised the warning flag about President Trump's proposal that was upcoming, and it did a day later, to do away with the Community Development Block Grant program. Um, that program has funneled funds to infrastructure in uh, uh, low- and moderate-income communities for 50 years, probably. And here, where we're going to spend a, million, a trillion dollars on infrastructure, they're talking about killing a program that already is a quote-unquote pipeline for infrastructure. It doesn't make a lot of sense. The other thing was to talk about uh, needing to get federal legislation regarding Internet sales tax, try to get that to happen. And just like the Trump announcement of trying to kill the block grant program, the day after we made that presentation, Albertsons announced they had reached, were reaching a deal with the state of Idaho, not Albertsons, Amazon. Amazon. We had reached a deal with the state of Idaho to start uh, automatically collecting and remitting, who remembers, 30 to $50 million in sales tax to the state of Idaho. So I don't know if we did any good or not, if we're just lucky on our timing, Mayor. <laughs> Catherine, you want us to skip you with your squeaky yeah, voice? I just want to thank Jim for going to the <laughs> fire department meeting before we take you. I'll go on to you, Gina. Thank you. I yeah. am going to demonstrate brevity, gentlemen. Um, I went to the Pathways Commission, and we talked a lot about things we need to get ready for the farmer's market uh, season, and that's all. John. Um, I have nothing. <clears throat> That's brevity. Okay, well, yeah. brevity. Yeah. <laughs> well, wow. One thing <laughs> I want impressive. to share with everybody, and I was very, very proud of this council, because on March the 8th, we had, there was a recovery center breakfast, and Judge Stagner did, uh, was the keynote speaker, and every single counselor, as well as myself, was there. Uh, gosh, I don't remember how many people, 219 people or something like that, 226? It but it was a fabulous event. It was a huge community thing it was a lot of fun and I was proud to be associated with these other six fine people up here. It was very, very nice. And the neat thing about it is everybody was kind of scattered around the place so we got a chance to really intermix and that's a big deal for us. They raised in the neighborhood of twenty thousand dollars? Twenty almost twenty nine thousand bucks. I remember right. Yep. And uh, so it was a huge event, wonderful event. Uh, and as Walter had said, we had the town of Gown on March the 9th, which was a pretty neat thing, meeting with ASUI leadership. It's always fun when we do that once. We try to do it once a year here and once a year on campus. We keep doing it because we get new st uh, student leadership, and that's a pretty neat thing to get a chance to get up. And, of course, any time I get a chance to talk in front of them, I love to do that. Everybody knows that, but it's a fun thing. Uh, and as Walter and Art had said, we did go back to National League of Cities. I was back there for five days, Gary accompanying us and uh, we were in various all kinds of different sessions and uh, the big thing like Walter said was some of the things you know we don't have any idea really what's going to happen and uh, that's kind of suspenseful for everybody and nerve-wracking as well but like Walter had said the community grant program there was talk about eliminating that it was talk about eliminating arts programs and other things and of course, added fifty-four billion dollars to the defense for our country. So all kinds of uh, interesting things are happening. And of course, nobody really knows how it's going to shake out until Congress gets a hold of them and goes through things. So I think we're going to see some interesting things, and hopefully, uh, this internet sales tax thing will help us. Uh, and uh, things like uh, repealing the grocery tax, cooler heads will prevail down in Boise, and uh, maybe forget all about that nonsense or. Communities can survive with what we need to survive with, and transportation to help fix and maintain our roads and infrastructure. As Walter said, it makes no sense to get rid of $52 billion in community block grants and then say we're going to do a trillion for infrastructure in America because it's us and our little areas here all over the United States that try to fix our streets and bridges and different things that we have got to work on and maintain. So hopefully we'll see how that goes. Gary, you got anything for us? The thing I wanted to comment on is we were doing the state of Idaho a favor by going to Washington, D.C. and dragging all the bad weather oh, with us geez. back there <laughs> while people out here enjoyed a few days' respite from the Thank snow you. that we missed. Yeah, we went uh, two weeks before, two solid weeks. They've been in the 60s, D.C. We get the drops of 24 with <laughs> the 
Eight inches of snow and a wind chill factor. And, <laughs> and we lost our luggage. Yeah, and we lost our luggage. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn, folks. So moved. moved. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, we are adjourned to 928. Thank you, everybody.